representation on a board to monitor and to provide governance over what is a public utility and a public resource. So I would like for to ask this, that's why I came to the executive committee, <laughs> because you have purview over the administration and over um, <laughs> the broader question of public boards and the code. And so I would like for this committee to research that and if you could provide some decisioning around that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. Um, you raised some interesting issues. Uh, um, we have the benefit of having uh, Council Member Winston, who chairs city utilities on this committee, something that we can coordinate. Um, and the other thing, too, is uh, most of the boards and commissions, that's handled through committee on council. So we, and Council Member Bakhtiari, I, I believe, will be here later. So you have the benefit of all three of those committee chairs being on here. But we'll get, carry your point um, further. All right, any other folks signed up for public comment? All right, seeing none, we're going to go ahead and move on then into our agenda. Um, before we go into presentations, uh, I understand that uh, GM Biodari from the airport, do, uh, is he here? Yeah, um, I understand that he's got a schedule conflict and we need to move his item up so that he can get to that. Uh, if there's no objection, I'll go ahead and pull up item number 45, which is 23-R3212 uh, on page... Well, it's on page 15 of the comments, but so I'll go ahead and read in that ca caption. A resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor to execute a change order with Matthews Kelly JV for project number FC9142, cargo expansion site preparation 2A and 2B at Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport in an amount not to exceed $13 million and zero cents. All services will be charged to and paid from uh, fund numbers and account numbers as listed and for other purposes. Uh, GM Biodari, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Councilmember B.B. Odari, Aviation General Manager. <clears throat> this is uh, another enabling work for us as we continue to work on expansion of our cargo facility. We're building a brand new facility out there, and so there are certain um, sites that belong to the Federal uh, Aviation Administration that we have to relocate to make provision for this cargo site. And so this is the site work to relocate three radar sites uh, to different locations. And each one of these sites will compose of four towers, 50 to 70 feet tall, uh, that the FAA was, will use to transmit um, communication uh, to pilots moving around the airfield. All right, uh, thank you, Jim Biodari. Any questions? <clears throat> I do have one for you. So it, this is structured as a change order. Is it simply a uh, just kind of we're continuing to phase, and as we enter the next phase, we're doing a change or versus a significant surprise in the project? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then this was also, uh, I believe we had a paper in transportation earlier that did the funding, associated funding for that. Correct. So the two are related. All right. Any other questions? Motion from Shook to approve. Is there a second? Seconded from Winston. Um, let's go ahead and open the vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The item is approved. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go back to presentations. Uh, first item is the fiscal year 2022 audit report. Uh, Yolanda Carr, Deputy CFO, uh, I'll turn the floor over to you and your team. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, oh, so, oh, oh, sorry, I'll turn it over to you instead. No, it's okay. <laughs> I was just introducing Ms. Carr. Um, just introducing our Deputy CFO, Yolanda Carr, will be going over the uh, FY22 audited financials. This is for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2022. Ms. Carr, take over. Thank you for the introduction, CFO Bala. Um, we wanted to start with the audit reports that we produce. We have a lot of reports that we produce in the Department of Finance. We have the annual comprehensive financial report which is referred to as the ACFR. Um, we have that for Central, we have it for Watershed, as well as Aviation. In addition to that, we have the pension funds. We have General, Fire, and Police. Um, we also have ancillary reports that we're required to submit to the state, um, E911, MOS, TSPLOS. We also have car rental, just to name a few. And we have the single audit. And really, that's the audit of our federal funds. We're still working through that audit. We hope to have that report issued at the end of March. 
On this particular slide, page three, I wanted to talk about the revenues that we bring in for the city. We have $2.8 billion that we actually collected at the end of FY22. Um, with that allocation, 27% is allocated to aviation, 2% for solid waste, 1% for city plaza, and we also have 46%, which is general fund, all others, grant funds, E911, just to name a few. Um, in addition to that, we have 24% that's allocated to the Department of Watershed. And so in comparison to this, last year we had $2.5 billion, but again, this year we closed out strong with $2.8 billion, so I wanted to share that. On this slide, and you may have seen this slide a few times, I know that CFO Bala um, actually um, presented this in FEC last month or the month before. Uh, we have $240 million for fund balance. This is the highest fund balance that the city has um, seen in history. And so we wanted to share that. Um, with our fund balance, we typically have 15 to 20 percent on hand um, to make sure that we can operate. Um, most of the time, um, best practices is to have three months. We have well above that. So we're in a really good position as far as our fund balance. We've had over 20 percent for the last 10 years. So just wanted to share this good news once again. Um, on the next slide, I want to talk about the Department of Watershed and their net position. Um, when you look at it, you know, they have $3.8 billion, and this is their operating fund as well as their r and &E fund. So some of these are tied up in the capital projects. But again, with the increase for the Department of Watershed, um, they had increases in revenues as far as the collections. We know that, you know, the businesses opened up. Um, so we had more businesses utilizing water. We have conventions that came to the city. So we were in a really good position as far as the collections for watershed. Uh, the next slide I want to talk about the Department of Aviation, their net position. You can see that it's pretty consistent year over year. Um, the unique thing about the Department of Aviation, they did receive funding from CARES and from the American Rescue Plan. And so they have been pretty consistent. You saw, we actually saw an increase in the demand for travel. And so with that, we had an increase in concessions, parking revenue. So we saw an increase with the Department of Aviation. And again, this represents their operating as well as their R&E fund as well. On this slide, we wanted to talk about the deficit funds. So with the deficit funds, this means that we have more expenses than revenues. Um, we are familiar with solid waste. So solid waste went from 29.6 million to 43.6, and that's just because we had to settle litigation in FY22. Group insurance is pretty constant. Um, we've had a deficit for the past few years, but we do have a plan of action. Um, we have an MOU, and we're going to come back before you um, to make sure that we right size this fund. But all in all, it's really just health claims over the years and higher claims and costs. So that's what we've seen. It's not unique for the city. But again, this is what we see here. But we do have a plan of action, making sure we're addressing both of these particular funds. Um, the next slide I wanted to talk about was pension. So we have the general fire as well as police. And if we look at FY22, we're kind of within that 70% range. And you'll see in the other years, we were a bit higher. And that's just because of the market, the assets of the market. The market was very volatile, but we do anticipate an increase in future years, but just wanted to bring that to your attention. So we think we're in a good place as far as with our pensions and the funding percentages that we have here. Um, the last slide, I want to talk about OPEB, which is Other Post-Employment Benefits, which is a fancy name for the medical insurance for retirees. So with that, we have a liability that we had to put on our books, and I think it's been about three to four years, this new accounting standard, GASB 75. Again, this is related to the insurance for retirees. Our liability is $884 million. You'll notice that $617 million is for general government. We have a portion for aviation, $100 million, $127 for watershed, and $40 million for the other enterprise, non-major enterprise funds. But the good thing about this, the liability last year was about a million, so it has decreased, one billion. 
So we're at 884 million. So we're in a good space. We are working closely with HR um, just to figure out how we can make sure that we continue to reduce this um, and to be responsive. So at this time, I'll pause to answer any questions in conjunction with CFO Bala that you may have. All right, any questions for uh, this, at this point of the finance report? I do have a question. I wanted to uh, go back to the slide that has our, um, the general fund balance. Um, just to comment there, in our, our, our clarification, uh, we are at the highest um, we've ever been, um, but there was significant jump in the restricted portion from 21 to 22. I could have CFO Ball just kind of walk us through the source of that. Yeah, so the <clears throat> restricted portion was uh, a kind of a, a reallocation and thought process regarding the deficit funds. So um, the deficit funds for solid waste increased from last year, but also this year the group insurance deficit fund is restricting the available balance until we get that MOU in place to uh, rectify uh, the deficit. So if you guys, as you know, the group insurance fund is a fund that everybody contributes and pays into. So when it accrues a deficit over time, it's just time for the city to go back and do a reconciliation process and charge back to each contributing fund how much of that deficit is, is, uh, is, could be appropriated. And so once that is put in place, you will see that uh, restriction uh, taken off. Okay. All right. So it's, it's really kind of the treatment of, of that change. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, Councilmember Hillis, followed by Councilmember Overstreet. Mr. Chair, thank you, Deputy CFO Carr. It may sound like there's an echo because you and I just went over this presentation, but uh, <laughs> we did. <laughs> um, one of the questions I raised is around the solid waste services um, deficit, and we all know that they have historically ran deficits. Rob from the general fund, we hopefully fixed that last year with the the new model that's been adopted. Um, so number one, what is you know the current look forward when we start to see these 23 numbers populate? Or, because I know it's going to be different, but I also want you to consider you know, when we <clears throat> crafted this legislation and moved the common goods services over to uh, the general fund, we were we received an estimate from DPW, that's true. say 20 million dollars. So the look. The look back needs to say, hey, they either hit that nail right on the head or well, they said it was going to be $20 million coming from the general fund, but it was really $30 million. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about the solid waste service, looking at the stuff that moved from the general fund and where we think the actual uh, now solid waste service fee fund will end up. Mike. Thank you for the question. So as you know, when we passed the solid waste race last year we did it kind of on a two-year uh, commitment um, and then we will come back to council with probably a more permanent structure but as we kind of uh, go into fiscal year 23 what we are seeing is uh, the solid waste um, service fees were probably a little bit uh, overestimated and then there's some efficiencies that um, Solid waste is working on right now. So overall, we do believe that the the fund should be in a slightly positive position this year, and the deficit shouldn't grow. But we will still need to discuss the efficiency uh, report that solid waste is working through. We uh, just transferred the twenty million dollars to the solid waste. There was a, p a paper that passed uh, FEC a few weeks back. So we're still in the middle of kind of really constructing and getting all the data points about what the future of solid waste services looks like and what the contribution from the general fund, frankly, needs to be. Uh, we're comfortable with the $20 million mark now, but as you said, uh, we'll probably come back and discuss what uh, is the optimal position for um, general fund contributions. And that also included the, the millage rate increase that we adopted last year. And just to be clear, the revenues or the expenditures were overestimated? So the, the revenues uh, were overestimated. The expenditures are going to come in less than we project. That is all I have right now, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Ms. Overstreet, did you? So I, um, I'm fine, actually. I'm, I'm good. 
But I did want to put an exclamation point that you all did take the time to make sure you met with indi individuals, each one of us, um, because I don't want anyone to think that we're seeing all of this for the first time and we have no questions, because we have plenty <laughs> of questions um, and um, True. during our one-on-ones. And I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. So thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. All right. Any other questions? All right, Ms. Carr, okay. uh, please proceed. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to CFO Bala and to Doug Moses, who's the partner at Malden and Jenkins. Thank you, Ms. Carr. Uh, I know we have some hard copies as well. If anyone needs some hard copies, I know the presentation is up there as well. Uh, thanks for having us here today to present the audit results. Uh, it's our first year doing the City of Atlanta's audit, and uh, we're very happy to have you all as a client. Um, before I get started, uh, I just want to say uh, hats off and kudos to the management of the City of Atlanta for doing a great job. Uh, first year, uh, new auditors is, is always tough. Uh, we kind of got behind the eight ball with the delay in the uh, audit contract being approved and, and also with the consultants assisting the City of Atlanta with GASB 87 being, I think, uh, approved in September or early October. So we kind of got behind the eight ball, but everyone worked very hard to meet the deadline, December 31st deadline. And so again, uh, they are very committed. Uh, you even had the director of uh, financial reporting trying to jump on the call when she was heading to the airport to go on a honeymoon. And the <laughs> wow. deputy CFO had to tell her to get off and enjoy her honeymoon. So <laughs> that's the kind of commitment we saw here at the city of Atlanta, something we appreciate and something that shouldn't be taken uh, for granted. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and start the uh, presentation. Um, just a quick update about Malden and Jenkins. Um, again, we've been around for almost 110 years. Our governmental practice uh, continues to be one of the largest niches in our firm, representing about 29% of the firm's practice. Uh, we have actually 14 offices in six states. Uh, our latest addition is in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, we audit over 650 plus governments. Um, 150 plus of them received the GFOA, oh, the GFOA Award in Excellence in Financial Reporting. Uh, and we're happy to have the City of Atlanta be part of that number of clients that received that um, award. Um, just like Ms. Carr alluded to earlier, um, you all prepare your own financial statements. If I had to guess uh, the number of our clients that actually uh, prepare their statements, it's probably about 3%. And so it's, it takes a lot of skill set and a lot of commitment in drafting those statements. And you all did it, an annual comprehensive financial report for the city as a whole uh, with your central office team aviation and watershed. And so again, that's, that's, that's awesome. All right. Um, as far as the engagement team leaders, again, I was the partner responsible for the overall audit engagement of the city of Atlanta. Um, have over 24 years of experience. Uh, James Bentz was the engagement, and I'm out of our Atlanta office. And then James Bentz was the engagement partner responsible for the aviation audit with over 20 years of experience. Um, he's in our Chattanooga office by way of our Macon and Atlanta offices. Um, Josh Carroll, who's here with me today, was the uh, engagement director that oversaw the watershed audit with 16 years of experience. Um, Will was the engagement senior manager, kind of overseeing the central as well as the watershed audit with seven years of experience. Then we had Tim Lyons um, out of our um, uh, Columbia, South Carolina office, did the quality control review for the city as uh, as a whole, and he has 14 years of experience. Trey Scott, out of, out of our Savannah office, uh, did the quality control review uh, for the uh, aviation. Uh, Christopher McKellar, um, out of our Atlanta office with over 18 years of experience, did the quality control review for Watershed. Um, Allison Wester, out of our uh, Sarasota office, um, did the um, was the partner responsible for the pension plan audits. Um, both the general employees, uh, police, and uh, firefighters. And then Wade Sansbury, out of our Sarasota office as well, was the quality control reviewer for the pension plan audits. And then, uh, just like uh, Ms. Carr alluded to, the single audit is ongoing right now, and Hope Pentagrass, out of our Macon office, is the partner responsible for that audit engagement. Uh, we did utilize two minority subcontractors, and they're here for me today. Uh, we have Bambo, uh, in audience, uh, and then also Ruth Washington uh, with Choice uh, Business Solutions, and we're happy to have them on board. They did a great job, 
and uh, we uh, look forward to our continued um, working relationship. So I just want to kind of let you know all of the resources at a higher level that we pro provided for this, um, this year's audit for the city of Atlanta. So a lot of experience. And again, all of us spend 100% of our time doing governmental audits. We don't wear different hats. The only person, um, as far as our uh, partners, that spend less time than 100 is Allison, and she's about 60% governmental. Um, so we bring a lot of expertise to the field. Um, on this slide here, I just want to say that there are other industries that we serve and other services that we provide other than your traditional accounting and tax services. As far as the financial statements, the financial statements are the responsibility of management. Our responsibility is to give an opinion that the financial statements are materially correct and we've issued an unmod unmodified or clean opinion on the city's financial statements uh, as a whole. Uh, we did um, rely on other auditors' reports for uh, Atlanta Development Authority, or Vest Atlanta, the Atlanta Fulton County Recreation Authority, as well as the Atlanta Housing Opportunity, Inc. Again, we relied on those other auditors' reports. Uh, we also issued clean opinions for aviation and watershed um, act first as well, and those are separately issued documents as well. And then we also issued clean opinions on the three pension reports as well. Uh, main thing here I want to point out, uh, <clears throat> as far as the report in accordance with the government auditing standards, the Yellow Book report, which will be included within the single audit report when it's released uh, at the end of March. Um, so we did have one finding that was considered to be a material weakness uh, relating to audit adjustments that we proposed during the audit engagement. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, there are also uh, findings relating to the pension plan audit too. Um, similar to the, the findings from the previous year that were uh, presented by KPMG. And so we've already uh, met with the Pension Investment Board and went over the results of the pension audit results, and as well as we've met with the Audit Committee and went over all of the findings in detail. As far as new significant accounting policies, the city did implement a new accounting policy as it relates to GASB 87 dealing with leases. And so um, you'll see the, in the footnotes where it talks about those policies. And again, this impacted the uh, governmental activities, um, aviation, as well as watershed. <clears throat> as far as our relationship with management, we received full cooperation from management staff and others. Um, there were no disagreements with management on accounting issues or financial reporting processes, or financial reporting matters, rather. As far as audit adjustments, uh, we did propose uh, some audit adjustments um, that did result in a finding, and we'll talk about that a little later. As far as past audit adjustments, um, there were some past audit adjustments as it relates to restating uh, beginning balances, um, but management did agree to make those adjustments in the current year activity for fiscal year 2022, and so those adjustments were made. It's just that they didn't restate beginning balances. As far as our independence, we are independent of the City of Atlanta and its financial reporting processes. Uh, there are no fees paid to Marlon and Jenkins for any type of management advisory services that will have impacted our independence as your external auditor. All right, uh, the next few slides kind of go over some financial trends, uh, looking at your general fund fund balance over the, five, over the last five years. And again, uh, you can see that you had about a $53 million increase in your fund balance. Uh, going from 187 million to uh, 240 million, so uh, doing really well there. <clears throat> Next slide is looking at your uh, fund balance as a percentage of, of total expenditures as well as transfers out. Uh, for June 30 governments, you want to see anywhere from two to three months of reserve or anywhere from 16 to 25 percent. That's the rule of thumb. Now, if you all were a December year end government, you would expect much higher reserves because you, by that time you would have co uh, collected all of your property taxes, which would be used for the next year's operations. Um, so you can see here you all are at four months reserve or 34 percent. And that's why the city hasn't needed to rely on a tax anticipation note to get you through those subsequent months until your property tax collections come in. So good job. <clears throat> All right, the next slide is looking at your uh, sanitation of solid waste fund. Uh, most solid waste funds are not cash cow funds. You know, it's not like an electric utility fund, which is truly a cash cow fund. Um, but you would just hope that your sanitation fund would at least break even. And so looking at the last five years, you can see that your deficit has grown. Um, 
and for your net position, uh, it did go from 110 million last year to 100, almost 115 million in 2022. Now you also have your uh, interfund balance, which is um, showing that the sanitation owes to the general fund. And that has grown over the years as well, uh, coming to about 43.6 million as of June 30, 2022. Uh, management has uh, put together a repayment plan because normally uh, if you're looking at how it was reported in the previous year, just shown as an interfund balance or a due to do from. And that um, shows that it would be paid within one year of fiscal year end. If that's not going to be completely paid within one year of fiscal year end, then it's either written off or you have to come up with a repayment plan and show it as an advance. And so management has decided to show that as an advance from other funds that would, will be repaid in about five or six years, starting in fiscal year 2024, and to start paying down that advance of about $6 million a year. And so again, um, hopefully you'll see that start trending down with that inner fund or that advance from the general fund as well as the deficit should hopefully be eliminated in the next few years. Uh, next slide is looking at your group insurance internal service fund. And most internal service funds you would expect uh, don't have an accumulation of net position because hopefully you're charging enough to cover uh, those costs. Um, like in the last several years, you can see how the deficit has grown um, over the last several years, uh, going from about 8 million in 2018 to about 43.8 million in 2022. And the advance or inner fund balance that's due to the general fund has grown as well from 7.6 million to 38.3 million dollars as of June 30, 2022. So again, uh, management has come up with a repayment plan. Uh, the city is looking at making fundamental changes to the group insurance fund and certain fund related budgeting practices that will hopefully eliminate that deficit and then also repay that advance from the general fund. So starting in fiscal year 2024, the city will be paying uh, about $5 million a year to bring down uh, that advance and hopefully eliminate that deficit in future years. <clears throat> Um, next slide is looking at your governmental activities and that position over the last five years. Uh, again, this is in thousands. And you can see that um, for the first time, the city has shown positive net position at the government wide level for governmental activities coming in at about $6.6 .6 million. Like most governments in the past, when they had to implement GASB 68 dealing with uh, net pension liabilities, when you had to show this full, full unfunded pension uh, liability on your books, and then followed by GASB 75 a few years later with OPEP. A lot of governments saw that their unrestricted net position went to a deficit, and some governments saw their total net position go to a deficit, like what the city of Atlanta has experienced. And so being able to come out of that, um, with, that with those two major impacts to hit your um, net position to now have positive net position for government activities is pretty good. So again, you're at 6.7 million, so hopefully that uh, upward trend will continue. <clears throat> Next slide is looking at your um, net position for business type activities over, the, uh, activities over the last five years, and again, in the thousands. And you can see how your total net position has grown from 8.5 billion to $8.8 .8 billion as of June 30, 2022. All right. Um, so that concludes like the financial trends. Um, there were some financial reporting changes in effect uh, for 2022. Um, the city's um, <clears throat> general custodial fund in previous years was shown as an agency fund. Uh, 2021, it was shown as a special revenue fund, but in following GASB 84 dealing with fiduciary activities, um, it needed to be shown as a custodial fund as part of fiduciary activities. And so we do have a restatement for that change uh, in those uh, funds to reflect that. And so you'll see um, a restatement of beginning fund balance for your uh, non-major governmental funds, uh, net position for government activities, and then the custodial funds. Uh, like I alluded to earlier with GASB 87, uh, again, that was implemented this year. Um, you know, GASB um, was concerned about a lot of governments not being ready to implement GASB 87 due to all of the, the influx of uh, federal grant monies and all of the complexities surrounding the accounting and reporting of those uh, federal funds, 
uh, Gatsby was concerned that a lot of governments were not going to be ready to implement the standard. So, and, and a lot of audits have been delayed because of that, but the city of Atlanta was, was able to avoid that and, uh, and implement it uh, in a timely manner. It had over 300 leases that they had to go through. So it was a lot of work on central aviation and watershed, but they pulled through and got it done and the city was able to um, uh, issue on time. Uh, now we're going to the findings. Again, we had one finding um, citywide that deals with fiscal year end closeout procedures. Um, and so the first little bullet under that one uh, finding uh, deals with the uh, OPEB, um, dealing with deferred outflows of, of resources pertaining to contributions, benefit payments made subsequent to the measurement date. And so most governments have the measurement date for determining what the, the liability is for OPEB one year in arrears. And so for June 30, 2022, the measurement date was as of June 30, 2021. Any payments made subsequent to the measurement date has to be reflected as deferred outflows of resources on your balance sheet, on your statement of net position. Um, the um, predecessor auditors were relying on, and management were relying on the actuaries to include that information um, in the reports. However, the actuaries could not get that information in a timely manner. So it's still up to the government to report what the deferred outflows are. Even if it's not readily available, you're allowed to make estimates. And so we got with management and it did make an estimate of what the uh, payments were subsequent to the measurement date. And the impact you can see here was about a $30 million adjustment to governmental activities, followed by $7.7 .7 million for aviation, I mean, sorry, watershed, 5.2 for aviation, and then about 2.4 million for sanitation. So going forward, uh, we do recommend management to get with the uh, third party administrators and see if they can timely provide that information to the actuaries or to, to the city while they're drafting this, the financial statements. And if it's not really available, then the city can use estimates to determine what the amount should be recorded. <clears throat> um, next bullet here deals with grant reporting. Um, dealing with GASB 33, dealing with accounting and reporting of non-exchange transactions, it's been around for a while. Um, you know, prior to this standard, a lot of um, governments and even auditors kind of looked at the, the matching principle. You match the grant revenues with the grant expenditures. However, with GASB 33, it says if there's no uh, eligibility requirement that's imposed by the grantor, then even if you haven't incurred any expenditures, you still recognize that revenue and you restrict fund balance for that grant purpose. And so we had to make adjustments to um, make adjustments to program income as well as the LMIG grant funding that was shown as unearned revenue on the, on the balance sheet. And so you can see the adjustments of about 1.8 million to the community development fund, about 15.5 million to uh, intergovernmental grant funds and then about $4 million to the Home Investment uh, Partnership Fund. Uh, we also had to make an adjustment for accrued interest payable for about $5 million as of year end as well. Uh, next slide here with some adjustments pertaining to your, all of your tax allocate, allocation district funds um, pertaining to property tax revenues, uh, receivables and unavailable revenues. We made some adjustments to kind of true up those balances at year end. You can see the various tasks that were affected by those adjustments. <clears throat> um, next slide here, uh, continuing on here with the one finding um, as it relates to the aviation uh, department, uh, unearned revenue of about $5 million uh, was still shown on the balance sheet and actually um, it was determined that the money was recognized in the previous year, so we had to make an adjustment to remove that activity from the balance sheet as of uh, June 30, 2022. Um, Watershed had a, an adjustment pertaining to accrued interest payable of about $9.7 million, um, and then also an adjustment of about $1.6 million pertaining to retainage payables that was still on the books that had been paid in previous periods. All right, and then um, for the pension, again, we had um, two findings here that covered um, all three programs or um, plans um, pertaining to census data as well as benefit payments. Uh, again, we picked samples and we had exceptions noted whether you know the hire date or termination date wasn't right or it was missing information and things of that nature. 
Uh, we did check with the actuaries. Uh, we went over the exceptions with them to see if it was significant enough to change the calculation of the net pension liability that's reported in the city's ACFR, and, and it wasn't significant enough to change that. And so, again, repeat findings similar to the previous years. Uh, I know you all have uh, consultants helping the city out to get the records clean. I think they're doing a good job. It's going to take some time to kind of comb through all of the records um, dating back from, from several years uh, to get everything cleaned up. But I think the city is moving in a positive direction there. All right, so we had six management points. Uh, this is recommendations for improvements. These are not considered findings, but just a management recommendation. Um, we also had some verbal, verbal uh, recommendations as well that we sat down and went with management on, over. Um, so this first one deals with uh, project tracking and property tracking and review. And so we just noticed that some construction and progress items that were completed in the prior year um, that should have been moved over to depreciable capital assets. And so we had to make some adjustments there, uh, nothing uh, material. Um, but we do recommend the city review its CIP project status during the uh, closeout period and again during the uh, preparation of the financial statements that's assured that you don't have any discrepancies there. Um, we also noted um, the city received uh, proceeds from two disposals of two real estate um, parcels um, that were not reported in the capital asset ledger and so, or previously uh, reported as land held for resale. And so adjustments were made there, and we recommend that the city annually review uh, property and land listings as well as proceeds re received from any property disposal to ensure completeness with the accuracy and financial reporting. Um, the second management point deals with accrued vacation or compensated absences. Uh, we noticed that the uh, Medicare tax portion was not included in that liability, and so we just recommend that the city include uh, the Medicare portion um, as part of the calculation for accrued vacation. Um, third management point deals with landfill post-closure liabilities um, and the need for updated engineer reports. Um, of course, the city has four closed landfills um, and they're kind of relying on the EPA, uh, EPD, uh, financial assurance-based report for determining what that liability is. Uh, it's probably more of a conservative approach. Uh, the liability recorded as of June 30, 2022 is about $17.6 million. Um, but having the engineers come, and come in and do an estimate um, and evaluation may determine that that liability is too high and may need to come down. But again, we just recommend having um, the city uh, reach out and, and have an engineering firm to uh, do those evaluations. Dealing with the ARPA grant funding reporting, um, the Georgia State Charter of, of, of Accounts require that the American Rescue Plan grant funds be reported in its own separate special revenue fund. The city has combined that in with the CARES uh, funds within uh, a special revenue fund with the CARES. Um, they've tracking it separately um, by different call centers, but again, the Charter of Accounts require it to be in its own special, rev uh, special revenue fund. So I believe management is getting with you all to uh, get that approved to be able to sh uh, show that as a separate fund in fiscal year 2023. Dealing with uh, governmental fund budgets, uh, of course, uh, state requires you to, to adopt a balanced budget on an annual basis for your general fund and your special revenue funds. Uh, we noted three special revenue funds that did not have a budget. Um, that is the Section 108 Loan Fund, the Atlanta Beltline Special Service District Fund, as well as the Atlanta Housing Opportunity uh, fund, which is a blended component unit. So we just recommend that you include those three funds as part of your annual um, budget, budget adoption. <clears throat> All right, and the last management point here is on the watershed management, dealing with accounts receivables. Uh, we noted there's an account labeled AR Harbor online that was reported as accounts receivable, but a fun, uh, further uh, discussions with management, it was determined that it was a, a balance that represented online customer payments um, that had been reported as receipt in the billing software, but not yet uh, deposited into the uh, department's bank account. So again, we recommend that you show uh, these balances as cash or cash on hand or deposits in transits and not reflected as accounts receivable at year end. All right, uh, you know, Gatsby continues to be very busy. Um, you know, when I started back in 1999, um, the biggest standard was Gatsby 34. 
and now we're at Gatsby 101. Um, you know, we're proud to, to say that one of our fellow partners, Joe Black, uh, is, is now the chairperson of Gatsby. And I'm sorry, I, Joe Black like the movie? <laughs> he may think so. <laughs> That's what, no, um, Joe Black is <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, Joel is the new chairperson of Gatsby, and I'm, I'm always kidding with him, uh, saying hopefully he can cut down on a number of new standards, but he always says that he's just one person, um, part of the board. So, um, But the main two I wanted to point out here is on Gatsby 91, dealing with condo and debt obligations, which is applicable for fiscal year 2023 the current year that you're in. Um, under the old standard, um, they, they allow more flexibility. Um, if you had conduit and debt that's issued by the development authority, uh, two third parties, it's not reflected in your books as debt. Um, again, it's debt of others. And sometimes a lot of the authorities have issues in determining what the outstanding balance is at year end. And so they're allowed under the old standard just to disclose what the issuance amount is. Under Gatsby 91, you can no longer do that. You have to report what the outstanding balance is as year end. Um, through Invest Atlanta, um, you all have about $2.5 billion of conduit debt. I believe the majority of that last year is shown as issuance costs. And so we are recommending that uh, city management, uh, along with management of Invest Atlanta, kind of work together to make sure that they're in a position to show at June 30, 2023, what the actual outstanding balance is. And so I've been uh, recommending that um, my clients almost treat it as if it's going to be your own debt. You're sending confirmations out. You're working with the trustees to determine what that outstanding balance is, kind of get ahead of the game. Then the last one I want to talk about is Gatsby Statement number 96, uh, deals with subscription-based IT arrangements. Uh, this is very applicable or similar to Gatsby 87, dealing with leases. And so if you have like a cloud-based uh, IT type uh, system that you're uh, utilizing or leasing, you have to recognize an asset, the right to use asset, as well as a lease liability, very similar to GASP 87. So we are recommending that the city continue to use the consultants that they use for the implementation of GASP 87 to assist with 96 as well. Um, so to kind of get ahead of the game there. But this will be applicable for fiscal year 2023. All right, we're almost done. I know that's a lot. Um, so uh, coming out of the recession in 2008, you know, a lot of governments did a lot of cutbacks, and one of the things they cut was going, sending their staff to training. And so we started uh, that next year providing free continuing education classes to our clients free of charge. Um, we try to do it four times a year. Um, you can earn up to 28 hours of CPE credit. You can see the various topics that we cover. Uh, coming out of this uh, recent pandemic and dealing with all of the complexities of the federal grants, the accounting and reporting of such, uh, we decided to hold more than just four. I believe last, in 2021, we probably held about eight to ten classes to keep our clients abreast of, of all of the changes and things that are going on to make sure they'll be ahead of the game. And so, again, if you can see the various topics that we provide, if anyone wants to be added to the invite list, just let me know. Uh, my email, as well as Paige's email, or emails are at the bottom of this slide. Um, just to kind of go over some other, uh, real quickly, uh, some other services that we provide. Uh, we do have a group that uh, specializes in IT cybersecurity solutions. Um, they do cybersecurity framework engagements, uh, system vulnerability assessment engagements, as well as penetration testing engagements as well. Uh, we also have a governmental advisory practice that's led by David Roberts. Um, and again, if you wanted to have some type of operational assessment done or performance audit done, uh, we have several clients that has engaged them to do a, like for instance, uh, Gwinnett County had them to do a, a countywide operational assessment. Uh, City of Forest Park, smaller government, had them to do a citywide operational assessment as well. Uh, it was well received, uh, over 300 uh, recommendations on how they can improve best practices and things of that nature and how they can get there. And so if y'all are ever in need of such a, an assessment done, just uh, let us know and we'll put you in contact with David Roberts. That concludes my presentation. Again, it was an honor and pleasure to provide auditing services for the City of Atlanta. Again, it, uh, your management team have done a great job. I know it was tough. Um, late nights early mornings um, but they got through it and 
we look forward to next year, and I know it's going to be even better. All right, before I open up for questions, I want to give the CFO a chance to, if, if you wanted to respond to any of the findings, if you were in agreement. And Yeah, no, I, I, we hashed it out a long time ago. <laughs> so we are definitely in the place of agreement right now. I do just want to take the time to acknowledge uh, Mr. Voss and the Malden and Jenkins team, who, uh, as mentioned before, we had a real short window of when these engagements generally begin to get it all done by December. Uh, and it took a, a lot of dedication, hard work, and professionalism on their part to uh, get us to the uh, closeout period in, in the end of December. And hats off, of course, goes to Man and Noble City Auditors team and, and everybody else who makes sure that this uh, engagement was in place for us to, to proceed. But we look forward to uh, you know, continuing collaboration, continuing work. I think everybody has the same vested interest here, just putting the city of Atlanta in a much better place going forward. Um, I know we're Atlanta, I've been here for 11 years, so I've, I'm pleased with the findings that, that we're seeing now versus where they were uh, years ago. And so we're heading in a much better direction. And like always, uh, new information, new thought processes, new ways of conducting business is, is good for uh, the city of Atlanta, is good for the taxpayers and the stakeholders of the city. So we appreciate uh, their hard work here. Thank you, CFO. All right, Council Member Overstreet, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so I also want to uh, acknowledge the fact that the recommendations that were made, we actually thought they were good recommendations and, I'm, and are actually implementing them. Um, and I'm not sure if that was clear, um, but I want to make sure everyone knows that, that um, you were, your team was very thorough and we absolutely, um, and, and qualified. I mean, I, I got all of that. <laughs> today um, but just want you to know that us as council we know that the recommendations were taken in a good way after you hashed it out um, and implemented for the city yes yes I, I forgot to mention that yes they've they've jumped on it ASAP on the recommendation so I, that's very appreciative a lot of times they kind of put it on the back burner but some clients do but not the city of Atlanta yeah you, you will see a couple of pieces of legislation in today's uh, committee meeting that are, uh, are are for those recommendations. One is for the ARPA transfer, and you'll see one for the landfill uh, consultant uh, uh, tr um, engagement as well. Thank you. Council Member Shook. Uh, thank you for the audit. I'm, I'm always tempted to ask what y'all do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask him the same question. <laughs> it's always interesting to see what new eyes see when they look at the books, because whenever a new firm comes in, it's always a little, we, we have to kind of recalibrate ourselves because it's always a little bit different. Um, I want to thank the finance committee, I mean the finance staff and your team, because this is a good audit. Yeah. And if, if there's people here who aren't sure about that and who want to see what a bad audit looks like, you can borrow from my bound collection in my file <laughs> I've seen some of the more legendary ones thank you for reminding me about Gatsby 34 that was <laughs> Old Testament style event that, that we had to uh, live through but I know no action is required here but I wanted to thank the uh, finance team uh, for meeting with us and, and, and to just state what Miss Overstreet stated uh, I think those led to a whole lot of questions and a whole lot of discussion at people aren't seeing here and then they, they might be wondering about that but thank you thank you mr. joke um, I want to echo the the appreciation I, I during my last tour of duty I do remember when we dreaded this coming out and it was everything that came out was significant um, versus this feels more, more like fine-tuning it's just a different perspective on interpretation of GASB or um, uh, the law and and I appreciate the fact the finances jumped on it already uh, and, and that we're basically just trying to kind of have a meeting of the minds and then set up success for the 23 one. Um, the training I was particularly intrigued by, is that typically in person or are y'all doing it? It used to be in person, but when the pandemic happened, we went virtually and we got more participants doing it virtually. And so right now it's, it's, it's still done virtually. Yeah, I, I, that's, I think it's a fantastic offering. And, and to the extent that the finance department, y'all have capacity to do it. I know that you're always pushed for time, but um, I would take advantage of that because it's, like you said, it's one of those things that we often lose during belt tightening, and uh, it's so important to make sure that we stay on top of all this. All right, Councilmember Bakhtiari. 
Softball questions. I Thank you. No, just like a couple small follow-up questions because I'm going to take this home and read it. Um, okay. More in depth, and I just want to state for the record that I love the visual of Councilmember Shook sitting in his office just screaming at crappy revenue reports that he has. Why you keep those? Who knows? But because they're crappy. <laughs> um, just a couple follow-up questions. I just this is I'm new, but based on everything we've gotten so far, they're right. This is like. I really appreciate the amount of information that's in this. I've actually learned a lot from this report. Um, I did just have a couple of follow-up questions. I was wondering the AR Harbor Online in regard to watershed. Uh -huh. uh, when I mentioned the money that was sitting undeposited, I was curious as to how long that money sat undeposited before it went into. That's a good question. I'm going to turn to either uh, my director, Josh, or either someone at Watershed to comment on that because I'm not sure. Whoever it is, would you mind coming up to the mic? Thank you. Uh, at the mic. At the mic. Just so the public can hear. I, I can hear you just fine. Thank you, though. Uh, at the mic. And introduce yourself. Bo. I know. It's very scary. I'm Philip Shaw. I'm with the uh, Department of Watershed Management, director. And it usually lasts, it rolls continuously, so it may last a day or two or three, but it's a rolling number of changing you know coming in and going out okay i appreciate that detail i was expecting something a lot worse so i'm glad to know it's just a couple of days um and i was wondering the mention the the part on the recommendations where it says that G, that i don't know how to pronounce it what it council member shook shay gasby oh gasby yes yeah. government account and standards board okay um for gasby uh for the piece that you mentioned where it's still other matters that are being considered um going under uh, go, the piece on going concern uncertainties and severe financial stress mm -hmm. that the report that's estimated to be out in mid 2025 is that also looking at how we may be preparing how what type of standing we are preparing for the next recession because i would say based on where we stand economically it's not too far off mm -hmm. so i was curious as to if this had recommendations on that or if it audited what our standing was or how we could be better prepare yeah it's certain disclosures that's additional disclosures that are be required if there's a going concern issue um not too many governments have those. There have been some that filed bankruptcy and things of that nature. So let's say, for instance, your general fund had a deficit of $200 million. That's your main operating fund. There might be some issues there that you would have to disclose in your footnotes about potential going concerns as it relates to that. So just additional footnote disclosures that would be required. And so I'm guessing and the an exposure drop on this topic is expected by mid-2025. I'm, I'm, that will contain more information that we're able to look at in terms of Yes, yeah, so it's in the exposure draft, and so they're still hashing out different things. A lot of times what GASB will do is, is send that exposure draft out to um, the, the profession, the CPAs, and, and allow time for them to comment. So all the stakeholders and individuals um, can comment on it and, and provide certain you know, recommendations. And so they'll go through that exposure draft, and then once all of that is kind of hashed out, then it, it'll become a standard. Okay. Um question for you follow-up questions would it be okay I think you said contact information maybe yes D Moses at mjcpa.com so you can call me email me we can have one-on-ones really brave of you to say that into the mic so thank you <laughs> um, I really appreciate that I have a lot that this this honestly you've taught me a lot sitting here so thank you for that and also for the record I wanted to wish CFO Bala a happy early birthday awesome happy birthday <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. If there are no further questions, we'll thank you um, and then send you and your team along uh, on your way. And we look forward to hearing back from y'all the next cycle. Thank you all. Y'all take care. All right. Have a good day. Okay. If there's nothing else on that presentation, uh, there is no action we need to take. Let's go ahead and move on to the next presentation, uh, which is an update, uh, Georgia General Assembly update, Kenyatta Mitchell. I am not this tall. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kenyatta Mitchell, and I am the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, along with my colleague, DeAndre Eberhardt. I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak to you this afternoon um, and provide an update on what's going on in the General Assembly. So slide two, get to that. We have a new state and federal um, government affairs partner um, for both these sessions. On the state level, 
On both state and federal, we've retained Holland and Knight, but we've added Impact to Public Affairs. A lot of you all know the folks at Impact. They, are, they have a stellar reputation. They know the city of Atlanta quite well, and they are perfect um, assistance to myself and to, and to DeAndre during the legislative session. <clears throat> we also added the group. I don't know if you all are familiar with the group. The group is a DC government affairs firm. Um, they are a minority firm. And the way that they work as well as impact is they work very collaboratively. A lot of government affairs firms, you are assigned a person and you have that person. But if anything were to happen, you don't have that appropriate backup. These firms have allowed us to have an appropriate backup. So it will definitely um, be, help the city be in a much better position now and into the future. And this new model has already provided tangible benefits to us. So we're very appreciative of them. The next item I want to bring up is our new Democracy Fellow update. As y'all recall, several months ago, you all voted on this fellow. Um, we, we had a temporary fellow during the legislative, during last year, during the election, and they helped with nonpartisan get out to vote. The funders at Baltimore Corp were so impressed with our work um, that they are giving us for free a professional for, for an entire year. My colleague DeAndre worked on this. And during this pilot, our fellow will build our capacity to mobilize civil engagement by encouraging voter participation. As you all know, voting is but one aspect of having an engaged citizenry. They will provide us with the capacity to innovate and help us by removing barriers and service connectors to elevate all of those groups that have been helping us on the local level thus far. Our fellow has accepted the job and he is going through a background check right now. Once that is complete, I will schedule a time if any of all want to speak to them, to talk about some ways that they can help engage the citizens in your districts. This slide is very tiny, so I'm going to kind of go through it quickly for you. These are all of the grants that we were a part of in the last year. So um, there's one grant that I do want to talk a little bit about that I'm very excited about, which is in Council Member Dozier's district. Our WOW team, and I got that from our um, our transportation commissioner, our wild team of senators of Warnock, Ossoff, and Congresswoman Williams brought us $30 million for safe streets. I don't want to undersell this one. Um, if you look at the accidents in these two corridors, you'll, see, see, you'll find pages of tragedy. I firmly believe this grant will save lives. Um, and I firmly believe that, well, I'm very thankful to, to the federal DOT for, for um, thinking that we're worthy of this award. Now, there's something very large missing here, and this is for Councilman Overstreet, the Campbellton Road BRT. We applied for a mega grant and we weren't successful. That does not mean we're going to stop applying. We're not going to apply for a mega grant next time around, but we are going to apply for a small starts grant for that Campbellton Road. It more closely qualifies and most, more closely matches the qualifications for that grant, so you have a better opportunity of securing it. But I have not forgotten about Campbellton. I just want to make sure that that is on the record. Um, so I know y'all are wondering when I'm going to talk about the General Assembly. Here we are. So the most important, well, let me start with this. Today is Legislative Day 19. So I should be across the street, but I'm here with y'all. <laughs> it's day 19 of a 40-day session. Crossover day is day 28, which is March 6th. And we will all get our lives back after March 28th. There is no single item that the General Assembly works on that is more significant than the budget. The state right now has a record high sub surplus, much like the city of Atlanta, at least relative to the history of the state, and has a very well-funded reserve. The single biggest use of state surplus this year is going to be an income, um, income tax refund of $250 per person, $500 per joint, um, and property tax relief of $500 per homestead. Beneath this number, the budget significantly increases state support for K-12, um, K-12 education across programs, including teacher pay raises. It enhances state support for higher education scholarships and funds a range of new economic development and workforce priorities. Um, not to pick on Councilman Dozier because he's not here, but I believe the last time I was here, he mentioned the fuel tax suspension. And this budget fills the revenue grant, never re revenue gap that was created by that exemption. So as y'all recall, we did not pay for gas tax on the state level 
from March 18th to, to January 11th. This budget refills that so the state DOT is whole again. The next item, and the thing I spend the most of my time on, are the two Buckhead bills. I will be leaving here actually and having a conversation um, with some folks across the street about Buckhead bills. Um, just so you know, Senate Bill 113 provides for the transfer of infrastructure, which is very problematic um, for the, to create the new city, and House Bill 114 will incorporate or create a new a, the city of Buckhead City, which does not roll off your tongue. Um, the next item I wanted to bring up is sports betting. Now, if y'all have been paying any attention to the General Assembly over the last decade, this has come up probably every year. Why I'm bringing it up now is it has the highest likelihood of going across the finish line either this year or next, and this is why. There was a recent, um, Harold Melton, our previous Supreme Court, uh, Chief Supreme Court Justice, who is now in the private sector, wrote a letter saying that sports betting no longer has to be a constitutional amendment, which means it could pass the General Assembly with a simple majority. This would provide additional money for HOPE scholarships because it will be under the lottery system. So I want you all to keep your eyes on this bill. It has the highest likelihood in the last 10 years I've been following it of passing. Another really bad bill is a piece of homeless legislation that, um, that, that actually passed the committee but is going before the Senate. Um, this homeless bill, and I don't know why the General Assembly is obsessed with making a tragic situation somehow and making it worse, but they want the city, they want to stop the city from adopting any policy that discourages, and there's no legal definition for discourages, or prohibits the enforcement of anti-camping ordinances. It would also prevent the city from prohibiting or discouraging, which again has no legal standard, police officers, city solicitors from enforcing this ordinance. In short, um, this will force us to arrest homeless folk, homeless people, which is three times more expensive than providing services. So what they want us to do is the most costly, least effective method. They want us to employ it. The city, they said, um, this bill will also enable any citizen to sue or bring a civil action against us if they feel that we're not doing a proper job. This is a bill that we're fighting. Um, this is a bad piece of legislation that will be going before the Senate. Another piece of legislation that came across the finish line after I sent this to y'all is Tuesday, and this is a good piece, House Bill 404. So if you've been watching, if you've been reading the AJC, there was a dangerous dwellings expose that, that came out. House Bill 404 will go about rectifying some of the issues that create bad housing situations. Um, my friend at the state capitol, Casey Carpenter, is a lead um, sponsor of this bill. And if there's any way you all could support, I hope you do. Um, the speakers for this bill, um, House leadership are for this bill, and I think it will go a long way towards giving renters enhanced rights. And I will thank you and stop for questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. We got a uh, queue of questions here. First up, Liliana Bakhtiari. <laughs> Are you surprised? A um, couple questions. One, extremely happy to have you on, as, in this position. As you know, I think you are probably the best, one of the best lobbyists in the state. That's my opinion. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I had a couple of questions for you. The piece that you actually mentioned, well, one, first, Sine Die is scheduled for March 28th? Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Uh -huh. And for anyone who doesn't know what that is or that's listening, Sine Die is the La day. Latin for the end of day, <clears throat> which means that that's the final day of the legislative session. So we like to be classy sometimes and use Latin. <laughs> All right. And would you also please explain for anyone listening what crossover day is and what that means? Crossover day is the last day that a bill could is successfully crossover from one chamber to the next. That is a little bit of a misnomer because we can always strip bills and add new items to bills. So theoretically, yes, it's the last day, but in practice, I've yet to see it actually work on every bill. Can you remind me for at the beginning of our two-year cycle or at the end? I, I... Beginning. This is the first day, okay. the first year of biennial. Got it. Um, and then the, the portion that you mentioned about getting people to come down and lobby, um, I would love to talk to you about perhaps hosting a um, citizen lobby day with the city. Uh, yeah, I know how much you would love that, but <laughs> lobbying workshops. So I will talk to you about that there oh, absolutely. in my district. Absolutely. Um, additionally, I just wanted to ask for the record, the Buckhead bills, are any of the representatives, I'm sorry, senators that are uh, dropping that legislation, do any of them live anywhere near Buckhead? Um, so the closest one lives 
in way north Fulton. So they have one person in Fulton. The sponsor lives about 200 miles away. So they're, they're locals. Locals. Okay. <laughs> As in they live in the state of Georgia, but not necessarily. They're in the state of Georgia, yes. The city itself. Yes. Okay. Uh, the other piece, there, I appreciated the, the bills that you did mention that you're watching. I was mm -hmm. been keeping an eye on the truck weight bill, the bill that would, that I believe that they're, uh, would allow for some of the timber trucks that come through our city to have ah, additional yes. weight. Yes, yes, yes. Sir. I'm particularly concerned about that because I don't believe our roads or our bridges can take that. Is where is that in? No, it passed the committee. Okay. Um, that is another bill, and I, I, I mean, honestly, I could bore y'all all with all the bills that we're tracking. That's another bill that we're tracking with the state DOT. Think about the extra weight, along with the fact that we're electrifying our fleets, so electric vehicles by themselves are heavier. Yes. And so the extra weight on roads with our climate change that's going on with our wetter winters and hotter summers also degrades um, roads. So altogether, this is very detrimental to the future of the roads in the city of Atlanta. And I believe, was I correct in assuming that at one of the hearings that one of the GDOT commissioner, I forget the name of the person's position. Russell they, McMurray. Thank you, came out and said no, <clears throat> that they did not want to see it. Okay, yeah. well at least there's some light there. Well, usually that's helpful. This year, it was not. So we need, we are reassessing the way that we go through trying to fight this bill. Okay. Um, and then I, my understanding is that uh, a RIFRA bill might also be dropping. Yes. So Ed Setzler is going to be dropping a RIFRA bill. Um, I just found out about that yesterday. It has not gotten a bill number yet. Um, almost no one is in favor of that. You state. But there are 20 sponsors on the Senate side. I'll say that. Could you state? For the record what the RIFRA bill is? The RIFRA bill is, is supposed to, and I say that pejoratively, mirror the federal RIFRA statute. They're always different. Um, no one is in favor of, I won't say no one, let me take that back. Leadership is not in favor of divisive bills. This is a highly divisive bill, and this is a bill that will codify discrimination. It would also outlaw our non-discrimination non ordinance in the city of Atlanta. So all of the air, all of the cities and counties that have worked hard, and I was for George, at Georgia Equality for years, we worked hard for these non-discrimination resolutions. All of those at the, at the signature of the governor, although I doubt he'll sign it, would go away. And, and I'm correct in assuming that not only is this morally horrific, that it would also affect business in our state. Yes, which is, which is why the Metro Chamber is fighting so actively against it which is how I was able to find out about it initially. Am I correct in assuming that the same legislator that introduced the abortion ban is the individual that introduced this paper? That is correct. Someone should have hugged him when he was a child. Um, also, I would like to also, uh, where are we, the anti-trans bill? So there are two anti-trans bills. Which one are you referring to? I'm asking if any of them have gotten any traction uh, at all. They have not, but again, you have to watch everything as if it can go to the end. So they have not gotten traction now. Um, and my uh, two last questions, I promise, then I'll move on. The <laughs> second to last, are we, should we be preparing ourselves for another anti-choice bill? No. no, not that, I, I, I would not expect anything to go across the finish line. Okay. It, we, our um, General Assembly was able to get voted in because they stayed dealing with infrastructure and jobs and all of the things that people are in favor of divisive bills as we saw in the state of Michigan and other states that flipped their general assemblies are not helpful okay. to them. And my last question, finally, mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed that the governor had mentioned that he wanted to encourage for municipalities to relax requirements around housing and build more housing most recently. Has there been any sign that the governor intends to remove any of the preemptions that keep us from doing what he asked us to do? So, no, I have not heard of anything like that. I just want to make sure because it seemed like a political statement, but in fact, the state could tell us how, what colors to paint our walls if they wanted to, and yet it doesn't seem that they've moved any of the preemptions to do anything like allow us to build more housing or more affordable housing or utilize other resources or, I don't know, allow for there to be rent control or caps on rent. So just wanted to, that's not a you, obviously. That's but not I just wanted me. to state all that for the record for anyone who might be listening, that even though that statement was said, nothing has allowed us to relax our requirements because the state won't relax theirs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, next up is Councilmember Overstreet. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just want a little more information about the 
SB 62, the homeless mm -hmm. legislation. I'm really not grasping what the oh, yeah. main issue is and what they're trying to implement. So there's an organization called the Cicero Foundation that's been going around the country trying to take homeless people from where they are in cities, which is kind of scattered, to consolidate them into one location that doesn't have proper sanitation necessarily. There's no regulation for that. There's no regulation for treatment. There's no regulation for wraparound services. So all the things that we know from history and from experience that assist with homelessness is not required in this bill. So the bill's main intent is to take homelessness so, and put it away so we can't see it. Got it. it, it there's no intention on helping people or, or supporting or anything like that. So um, as you were, uh, going through it the first time that is what I envision that that's you're right but um I was hoping not I, you're hoping I, for better <laughs> yes I was hoping for better <laughs> yeah. because I wanted it to be something that we could actually look into or consider like I've uh, had conversations with Georgia State University about doing a study yeah. uh, because once upon a time there was a federal initiative that helped with um not just homelessness but uh, mental health and mm -hmm. other issues so that it was a federal budgeted situation. So I've talked to Georgia State University and trying to figure out who's really responsible for homelessness. I know the city of Atlanta's services are not, you know, that's just not in our budget. Where it's not a, a homelessness in the city of Atlanta is not a city of Atlanta budgeted item. Um, so I wanted to talk to Georgia State about Who's responsible to do what around homelessness? Because this is what they do as an entity. Um, they, you know, send. They do the proper research and um, and have recommendations. I think that we're at a place now where that's what's needed. Because what happens is everybody's throwing spaghetti at the wall, and whoever picks that spaghetti up is the one that's going to cook it. You know, uh, and. I don't want it to be pieced together that way for the sake of not just the city of Atlanta citizens, but everyone. Right. It's just not something that we should be doing. Um, so I don't see how, you know, the, the hurting of the homeless and putting them all in like a tent city mm -hmm. is the answer. I don't see that at all because for all the reasons that you stated, um, I know the mayor of of um, California, of um, I mean the mayor of Los, Los Angeles, Angeles mm -hmm. uh, said that it's a state of emergency. It is. That's what I think uh, Mayor Bass did on day one. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that's where we are too, um, because what we can't have is the state telling us how to handle a homeless situation, and we come up with answers like that. So I will say this, that thankfully our situation is not the same as LA. Right. LA has the largest um, encampment in the country. Um, they're, they're slum, yeah. So it's, a, it's quite a bit different. We have made strides towards alleviating our homeless situation. Unfortunately, Councilwoman, a lot of the things that mitigate homelessness, there are some things for veterans, some things with AIDS, for AIDS, people with AIDS, HIV, there's a different bucket of who gets what assistance, where and how, mm -hmm. and that's part of the issue. Who divvies that up and right. who decides? Right. So, I don't know. We don't have the answer today, obviously. No. But um, just wanted more information about that SB 62 to see if it was what I was envisioning. It's it's that and probably worse. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And okay. Council Member Bakhtiari just stated too that. Um, there was a commission or a task force or a committee that was put together last year to make mm -hmm. recommendations. To, they did. Uh, it sounds like this is not in, even aligned with any of the findings of that. So there were three recommendations that were in line with the folks who signed on to this bill out of the, I think, 15 recommendations, and they chose these as their, to, to become a bill. No. Well, the committee was, but this legislation was not. And it, the vote was on by part, was on partisan lines. The, the Dems voted against it and the Republicans voted for on, on that particular committee. Council Member Hillis has the floor now. Mr. Chair, um, 
thank you for the presentation. Um, are you familiar with uh, SB 153 yet? Which bill is that? It's the, uh, I guess it's being called the uh, stadium, oh, yes. public safety stadium surcharge. I am. There actually, there's a hearing for it, I think at 4 o'clock today. Yes, I just wanted to make my colleagues familiar since it was referred to FEC. We, I did a walk-in to public safety on Monday to show support for that bill. One of the sponsors, Senator Albers, uh, requested that. Uh, so basically what it would do, those that were, I guess the two that were with me last term, uh, I introduced a bill uh, in uh, 2018 uh, looking to study this. Uh, we ended up not passing it um, because we knew even if study recommended it conflicted with state law at the time preempted uh, but it would uh, set up the framework for cities to be able to impose a surcharge at event ticketed events at uh, locations that have over 9,500 seats so a few places uh, here in the city of Atlanta I know there's one in Savannah uh, Macon a few others but um, hoping to get that bill passed so then the city can take action because uh, they're estimating it could produce up to somewhere between 10 12 million dollars in revenue for the city uh, that would be uh, specifically allocated to uh, public safety uh, resources like uh, fleet purchases you know in dire need of fire trucks and police cars uh, as well as um, precincts uh, and uh, fire stations so we'll get to that uh, in the uh, <clears throat> in the uh, agenda, but I just wanted to put that on everyone's radar. Yeah, and honestly, fight, fight for us over there. <laughs> <laughs> but as you mentioned, I think it's in Senate Finance uh, here in a little while. So it will be, and it's a high likelihood it's going to pass out of, out of the committee with flying colors. No, probably pass through both chambers as well. I can't imagine anyone saying anything against that bill. Honestly, I would have spoken for it if I if I weren't here. Much. Other questions for Ms. Mitchell? I was going to say, let's go ahead and send her back over so she can go continue fighting the fight for us over <laughs> thank you. the Gold Dome. So thank you, and we'll see you next time. All right, any other comments on the presentations? Okay, uh, let's try and move quick. We do have a long agenda today, so I'm going to try and move us quickly through the legislative items. Um, first up is the consent agenda ordinances for first reading. Ms. Kempson, right, if I can have you sound those two items um, so that we can receive them and then dispense with them next cycle. Item number one is 2300-1100, an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee to amend Ordinance 20-1396, adopted by the Atlanta City Council on June 15, 2020, and approved by operation of law on June 24, 2020, by adding an additional funding source on behalf of the Atlanta Department of Transportation, all of the parts of the ordinance to remain unchanged and for other purposes. Item number two is 2300-1101, an ordinance to amend Ordinance 20-01050, adopted by the Atlanta City Council on February 3rd, 2020, and approved by operation of law on February 12th, 2020, by adding an additional funding source. On behalf of the Atlanta Department of Transportation, all of the parts of the ordinance to remain unchanged and for other purposes. All right, thank you, and we will see these again next cycle. Uh, ordinances for second reading. First item is 23-01062, an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee to authorize the city on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs to accept the don donation of funds to the Public Art Trust valued at $115.00 to support the Public Art Trust for art conservation, the donation to be deposited into public trust account numbers listed herein, and for other purposes. Mr. Witherspoon. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Robert Witherspoon, representing the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. Uh, this ordinance will allow the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs to receive a one-time donation of $115 to support the city's conservation and maintenance program for public art. Um, the donor's name is Terry Thal of Denver, Colorado. This donation was initiated after the city provided a free downtown public art tour, and one of the participants was impressed and wished to support our, our conservation program. All right. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Witherspoon, Mr. Hillis. I don't think my question is necessarily for Mr. Witherspoon, but in general, probably to law. Why in the hell are we wasting people's time and paper to expend $115? It's to receive. It's a donation. It, well, exactly. We can't, the city can't take a $115 donation without legislation. 
Good afternoon, Amber A. Robinson, City of Atlanta Department of Law. As currently written, the code does not permit that, nor does the charter. The council must approve the acceptance of all donations. I would request that you look into that and maybe uh, raise that up to a uh, more reasonable amount. <laughs> Uh, right, is there a, I'd be happy to review that and make some proposals to you, this committee. All right, there's a motion from Baxiari. Is there a second? second? Seconded by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. Vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved. Thank you, Mr. Witherspoon. Sorry about Thank you. <laughs> Uh, 23-01063, an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer on behalf of the Atlanta Department of Transportation uh, to pay all outstanding invoices to Precision 2000, Inc. for uh, FC 1190431, State Route 260, Glenwood Avenue, US 23, SR State Route 42, Moreland Avenue, Intersection Improvement Project number listed in an amount not to exceed $138,852.57. All invoices to be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed herein and for other purposes. Um, Mr. Abbasad. Ibrahim Abbasad, uh, Interim Deputy Commissioner for Capital Projects, Atlanta DOT. This legislation is um, to pay an outstanding invoice for uh, the Glen Moreland Intersection Improvement Project. That's due to um, unforeseen infrastructure improvements, such as drainage structures, curbing, and asphalt. The work is already completed. It's just paying this invoice. All right, there's a motion from Shook to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Bakhtiari. Any discussion? Mr. Hillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I was looking at the staff comments and it looks like this project uh, received multiple extensions that totaled 21 months and at least in this these comments it appeared to do with uh, utility relocations when this contract was sent out to bid did it have a UAS and the uh, contract or what, what were the issues and how are we looking to not run into these again yeah um Basically, that's correct. There is a lot of challenges that have in this, in this project, including utility relocation. Um, the contractor also requested a number of claims regarding that. We looked at that, and we denied these claims based on a contract requirement. But um, to answer your question, we always do our best to make sure that we follow what's in the contract and what's required by, in this case, the federal, there is a federal fund on this project, so we go by their requirements too. Thank you. Thank you, other questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the vote, please. Vote is open. <clears throat> you said the project is complete, right? Yes. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you. Vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved. All right, colleagues, I'm going to, without objection, I'm going to take all the carry forward items together. Um, the first one, though, is 23-01072, an ordinance by council members Matt Westmoreland and Keisha Sean Waits. Um, and there is a substitute for this. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll read in the new caption, and then council member Bakhtiari has made the motion to bring it forward. It's an um, ordinance by council member Keisha Sean Waits, as substituted by Finance Executive Committee authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $18,500.00 from the Post 3 at-large carry forward account to support various organizations assisting with youth violence prevention and for other purposes. I'll second the motion to bring that forward. Let's go ahead and open that vote, please. Vote is open. And the substitute changes the amount from 12000 to eighteen five. The vote is closed. The substitute is before you. Yep, six days, zero days, that motion carries. Um, Ms. Kempson Wright, so I can still take the others with it, even though this one is going to be adopted on substitute? Okay. All right, let's keep going. I'll, I'll call up the other ones. Item number 7, 23-01076, an ordinance by Councilmember Amir Faroki, 
authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $2,000.00 to the Inman Park Neighborhood Association and for other purposes. Uh, item number 8, 23-01077, an ordinance by Councilmember Amir Faroki, authorizing the transfer of $20,000.00 from the Council District 2 Carry Forward account to the Council District 2 Distribution account to continue serving the Atlanta community for the public good and for other purposes. Number 9 is 23-01078, um, an ordinance by Councilmember Amir Faroki. Nope, that's not right. Sorry. Uh, let me jump to 11. 23-01083, an ordinance by council members Antonio Lewis and Matt Westmoreland authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $6,000.00 from the District 12 and post to at-large carry-forward accounts to Blueprint 58 and for other purposes. And item number 18, which is 23-01093, an ordinance by council member Alex Wan authorizing the transfer of $5,000.00 from the Council District 6 Carry Forward account to the Council District 6 Distribution account to con continue serving the Atlanta community for the public good and for other purposes. I'll make a motion to approve all of those items. It's seconded by Shook. And Council Member, actually, if you can make an, a motion to um, approve item number five by itself, we were informed by a parliamentary to take it separately. Very Thank good. You. Okay, so that, let's take that one first. 23-01072. I'll move to approve on substitute, seconded by Shook. So let's open the vote on that one item. One moment. The vote is closed. 68, zero nays, the motion carries. That item is approved. So that, that means items 1076, 1077, 1083, and 1093. Uh, we'll take it a block, and I'll make the motion to approve those items as is. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. Those items are approved. Moving along, 23-01074, an ordinance by council members Westmoreland, back to Ari, Winston, Over, Collier, Overstreet, and Dozier, authorizing the city of Atlanta to donate a um, total amount not to exceed blank dollars and zero cents to Park Pride to support green space improvements and upgrades in communities across Atlanta and for other purposes. Uh, the author has requested that we hold this for one cycle, so I'll make the motion to hold. Second. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item will be held. All right, without objection, colleagues, I'm going to take item 9, 16, and 19 together. Um, they're all related. It have to do with kind of renaming funds per the audit findings, I believe. Oh, no, no, no. This is uh, reimbursing funds to the um, general fund from the ref uh, Moving Atlanta Forward at referendum. So 23-01078, an ordinance by Council Member Amir Faroki to authorize the Chief Financial Officer to amend the fiscal year 2023 general fund budget in the amount of $2,950,000.00 to reimburse the uncommitted fund balance for funds initially established for the one-time capital cost necessary to build out the Center for Diversion and Services within the Atlanta City Detention Center, which will now be funded with bond proceeds, General Obligation Public Improvement Bond Series 2022A, and for other purposes, item 16, it's 23-01091, an ordinance by Council Member Alex Wan authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the fiscal year 2023 general fund budget in the amount of $6 million and zero cents to reimburse the uncommitted fund balance for funds utilized to support the emergency demolition and reconstruction of Cheshire Bridge Road due to the natural gas fire, which will now be funded with TSPLOS proceeds and for other purposes. And number 19, which is 23-01095, an ordinance by Council Member Dustin Hillis authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the fiscal year 2023 general fund budget by transferring appropriations advanced from the uncommitted fund balance to non-departmental in the amount of $7.5 million, even for the acquisition of 75 acres of land from the Conservation Fund to increase parks, green space, recreation, and watershed land in the city to be reallocated to various department operating budgets and for other purposes. Um, colleagues, do you have any questions for um, Dr. Wilson and the Finance Department for this? If not, there's a motion to approve from Shook. Is there a second from Hillis? 
There's no further discussion. Let's go ahead and open the vote on those three items, please. Vote is open. Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. Those three items are approved. Thank you. Um, item number 10, 23-01082, an ordinance by Council Members Lewis, Winston, Faroki, Amos, Dozier, Bakhtiari, Juan, Shook, Waits, on and Boone to ratify services rendered in connection with agreement number listed, ARPA gun violence prevention services with Cure Violence Global in accordance with section number listed, Article 10, Procurement and Real Estate Code of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances, and to authorize the mayor or his designee to enter into Amendment Number 1 to the agreement to extend the term for one year beginning retroactively on December 20, 2022, and ending on December 19, 2023, on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Equity, Diversion, and Inclusion, and for other purposes. Mr. Pace. Good afternoon, Chairman Juan, members of the Finance Exec Committee. Uh, Theo Pace, Deputy Chief of Staff, Office of the Mayor. Uh, the purpose of this legislation is to extend the agreement with Cure Violence Global uh, for the dates that you just mentioned, uh, for the purpose of allowing this organization to complete its work. Uh, there's no additional funding being added to this agreement, but it would allow them to complete their outreach training uh, with workers, violence interrupters, and other program staff. All right, questions from Mr. Pace. Motion from Shook to approve, seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries that item is approved. All right, now item number 12, 23 01087. There is a substitute for this uh, that. Just got handed. Motion from uh, over uh, from Bakhtiari, seconded by Shook. Let me read the caption because it uh, it does change the caption. I believe it's an ordinance by Council Members o uh, Collier, Overstreet, Bakhtiari, Hillis, Boone, Lewis, Bond, and Westmoreland, as substituted by Finance Execu Executive Committee authorizing the chief financial officer to transfer funds in an amount not to exceed five hundred thousand dollars and zero cents from the general fund non-departmental to trust fund to be used to fund the atlanta jazz festival to be paid to and from accounts listed below and for other purposes um so uh, let's open the vote to bring that forward the vote is open Vote is closed. Substitutes before you. All right. Uh, so we have that before us. Before we go on, um, since we have a number of jazz festival papers, I'm going to read all of them in so that we can talk about them and block, um, but that we will vote on them separately since this one's uh, in, on substitute. The first one is item number 14, 23-01089. An ordinance by Councilmember Andrea L. Boone waiving the competitive source election requirements contained in Article 10, Procurement and Real Estate Code of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances, and authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to enter into agreements with performers, artists, media outlets, and sponsors for the 2023 Atlanta Jazz Festival in Atlanta, and allowing the mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs to charge admission fees for select events at the festival and directing that all jazz festival revenues and expenses be deposited and expended from the accounts listed below and for other purposes. Items 21, uh, 20, 23-R3152, it's a resolution by Council Member Marcy Collier Overstreet authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to enter into con contract renewal option number one with four stay services LLC, uh, contract number listed stage services on behalf of the mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs in an amount not to exceed $19,825.00, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from funding numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Item 21, which is 23-R3153, resolution by Councilmember Marcy Collier Overstreet authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to enter into contract renewal option number one with Atlanta Productions doing business as Music Matters, contract number listed, sound audio services on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs, in an amount not to exceed $26,165.40, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from funding numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Item number two, um, I'll go ahead and read it in. We're going to hold this one, but I will take these actions appropriately. But 23-R3154, resolution by Council Member Marcy Collier Overstreet, authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta, enter into contract renewal option number two, 
with Premier Events LLC, contract number listed, festival management services on behalf of the Atlanta, uh, Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs in an amount not to exceed $41,500.00, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from funding numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Item 23, which is 23-R3155, resolution by Council Member Marcy Collier Overstreet authorizing the Mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to enter into contract renewal option number two with Witten Management Inc., contract number listed, waste management services on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs in an amount not to exceed $40,500.00 and zero cents, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from funding numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Number 24, we've got five more, y'all. 233156, a resolution by Council Member Marcy Collier Overstreet, authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to enter into contract renewal option number two with DNB Rentals, Inc., doing business as Atlanta Tent Rental, contract number listed, rentals on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs in an amount not to exceed $30,853.00. All contracted work to be charged to and pay for funding no numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Jump to number 27, which is 23-R3162, a resolution by Council Member Andrea L. Boone authorizing the mayor or his designee, designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to enter into contract renewal option number one with Atlanta Productions doing business at, as music matters. Contract number listed, lighting services on behalf of the mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs in an amount uh, not to exceed $20,286.00, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from funding numbers listed herein. And for other purposes, item 28, a resolution 23-R3162, uh, resolution by Council Member Andrea L. Boone authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to enter into contract renewal option number two with Phoenix Concessions, LLC. Contract number listed, vendor management services on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. On co all contract revenues shall be deposited into accounts listed herein and for other purposes. Number 29 is 23-R3163, resolution by Council Member Andrea L. Boone authorizing the Mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to enter into contract renewal option number two with Sunbelt Rentals, Inc. Uh, contract number listed. Electrical services on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs in an amount not to exceed $45,947.00. All contracted work to be charged to and paid from funding numbers listed herein and for other purposes. And item 47. Uh, there will be a substitute for this. I'll go ahead and read this in there. 23R3214, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs to administer the municipal support for the arts program as required by Section 110-38 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances through the provisions of, uh, of donations to eligible tax-exempt organizations and entities in individual amounts not to exceed $75,000.00 in a uh, total amount not to exceed $2,000,000.00 for fiscal year 2023 in accordance with Section 6-6. 306 of the City of Atlanta Charter authorizing the Mayor or the Executive uh, Director of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs as the Mayor's designee to execute donation agreements with eligible tax-exempt organizations and entities necessary for the administration of the municipal support for the arts program for fiscal year 2023 on behalf of the City of Atlanta to authorize the Chief Financial Officer to charge to and pay the donations authorized hereby from the account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Actually, I don't think that last one is Jazz Festival. Related, but I read it. Huh? Okay. Yeah, I do too. Once that comes up. Okay. So now we're we'll do that separately because it's not necessarily related. All right. So now that we have all those read in, um, Ms. Prothro. Yes. I'm going to have you speak to so these. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, Monica Prothro, Deputy Director for the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. So the legislation before you is to. Um, will assist the Office of Cultural Affairs to produce and present the 46th Atlanta Jazz Festival that would take place May 26th to the 29th in Piedmont Park. And so the first piece is to request for the $500,000 to assist with expenses. Um, there are several renewals that you just read in, and those renewals would be covered by funding that is, in, that is currently in the OCA Trust, the Atlanta Jazz Trust account. But this 500000 would assist us in, to cover additional expenses, one that would include um, security for the festival, post-certified and T-shirt security. And right now, those quotes are coming in about $160,000. Um, this 500000 will also assist us to cover EMS, 
um, staffing and ambulance services for the, for the festival event, which will be three days. Um, along with that, pullable toilets, performance fees, fencing. So that five hundred thousand that we're requesting will assist us to cover those fees. I just those expenses I just referenced. Okay, and then the other ones are specific contracts, um, are renewal options that will allow you to get uh, engaged with the vendors, correct? Correct, and funding for those renewals, um, there's funding in the Jazz Trust that covers those renewals currently. Okay, all right, so um, I'm going to start with some questions, and then if anybody else has some questions. Uh, so overall, what is the operating budget for the 2023 Jazz Festival? So that budget is coming in about $1.2 million. All right, and so from that, um, it, where we're sourcing it is five hundred thousand uh, dollars being proposed by this legislation. Correct, line and item we from have it. Yes, okay. from the general fund, that five hundred thousand be sourced by the general fund that would be transferred into the Atlanta Jazz Festival Trust account um, to cover the remaining expenses. We are actively seeking sponsorship to cover those expenses, working with the um, sponsorship the partnership director with the mayor's office. Is there an existing balance in the uh, in the trust fund right now? It's about two hundred thirty thousand dollars. Okay, so if I'm correct, budget of one point two million. You're asking for five hundred here. You've got two hundred thirty in the trust, so you're you have to raise a half million dollars. Correct. Um, to cover everything and make yourself whole for that, and anything above that just kind of carries forward and it gets. That is correct. What what has been kind of the track record in terms of fundraising? Um, it varies. Um, for fiscal year 23, we got about $300,000 in sponsorship dollars. That was for 22, fiscal year 22? Fiscal year 22, yes. My What's the high water mark in terms of fundraising dollars? It depends on our expenses. So our, our fundraising benchmark is determined by our, our expenses that we're going to, and it varies from year to year in terms of expenses. Uh, the last two years, we've seen how current labor expenses have, have increased. Um, with the production needs that the festival have. So is there a year where we've actually raised $500,000? I want to say maybe the last two, uh, prior to the pandemic, yes. Okay. We did see a decrease in funding coming right during the pandemic and right after, particularly when we went to fundraise for the 22 Jazz Festival. And then who, what is the tip, what's the profile of our typical Funders, yeah. um, there are corporate founders. We have Publix has been a sponsor, PNC, Coca-Cola, AARP, a lot of corporate sponsors. Okay. Um, what was the amount that we funded last year, do you recall? I believe last year was 400000 You're asking for an increase of $100,000 this year? Correct, and that is, it's the driver's debt is our security costs. Okay, and then my final question, and I see two other council members have questions. The remaining resolutions and the contracts that are there are essentially included in the um, in your but your 1.2 million dollar budget. Right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Um, all right. I will hand the mic over to Council Member Collier Overstreet and then back to you. Thank you for coming with all of those details. My pleasure. Um, and this is one of my favorite, and it's probably why you heard my name so many times. <laughs> Um, this is one of my favorite um, programs or uh, shows that we do as a city. And I dream of a day when we're not piecemealing it and where um, the skies are blue and the grass is green. We dream <laughs> and that we day as well. actually um, invest in our jazz festival. I have a few things that are important to me. The seniors are one. Um, and this jazz festival is one. Um, so um, I just want to know where are we with a budgeted item for our jazz festival uh, coming up this budget cycle? We were so close. So maybe in May I'll see something I've never seen before. That's our desire to include that the jazz festival be a part of the um, fiscal year budget for tw starting in 2024 and years after. Ooh. That's our See, hope. We're that's all to, I want. I'm dreaming. The sky is blue, the are, grass is green, and I may have a jazz are, festival budgeted in our FY24 budget. Thank you. We are dreaming with you and willing to um, work. <laughs> <laughs> 
and willing to work with finance and administration to see how that we can make that work. Thank you. That's all I want. All right, Councilmember Bakhtiari. Thank you uh, for everything. I, I do have a couple. We, we had a, a number of questions about this last year. Okay. And so I'm sorry, I don't know if you were here for those questions. I don't know if you were in the audience. I know that you weren't presenting to us last time. They might be Miss Love. Yes. And so, <laughs> what's this love? <laughs> and so, uh, as Councilmember Overstreet said, like, this is a great event. Um, I do have some questions because one of the things we consistently asked last year was for a count to occur. And the numbers we were given were a little too exact and too similar for me to really believe that that was the actual count. Is there a way that we can add in? Because we need to really be tracking if we're going to be investing uh, money into this. And I would love to see this type of investment for arts across the board. Um, more, actually, given that it generates so much funds. Um, so you're requesting a list of expenses and uh, revenue for a period of time? Uh, no, we're talking about attendance. We wanted to see oh, the attendance. attendance for the yes, the attendance for the event. The numbers were a little. Uh, it was interesting to see that the projected number was the same exact, like number each year, which led me to believe that it wasn't accurate. So I'm wondering if we can perhaps do a count this year, an accurate count. So we're working with that. We rely on numbers, projections from APD after the festival is over, in terms of what our attendance is. Um, we're, we can, we will look to see how we can work with them to. Make sure that the numbers are accurate as possible. Um, and to be, and you said uh, that you all are opening opening this up to corporate sponsorship as well. Yes, absolutely. Okay, because I believe that was one of our concerns last year, was a lack of outside sponsorship and it just coming from the city. Um, and I also saw that somewhere it mentioned that this event is estimated to raise fifteen million dollars for the city. That's the projection. Do yes, in terms of hotel. Um, the economy and the people come into the city during the festival that is the that's the estimated benefit to the city do we have anything to back up that estimate any sources we could draw from any evidence of we will provide that? documentation that would be that. super helpful okay. if you wouldn't mind thank you all right council member winston thank you mr chair uh you spoke of um some opportunities on um, sponsorship dollars to be able to generate some revenue. Are there other generating or revenue generating mechanisms that we have, for instance, charging food vendors to be at the festival? Yes, so there are uh, food vendors, there are merchandise vendors, there are, um, there are vendors that, yes, food and merchandise vendors, and then we have a merchandise tent as well for the Jazz Festival merchandise. Okay, and then I know a, a, a number of council members, including myself, are having our own satellite concerts in our district um, are there also potential revenue opportunities in at those satellite concerts as well we're open to the conversation we haven't explored that in previous years but we're open to the conversation okay all right thank you Just real quick can i yeah go ahead Councilor Winston, are you like indicating something like impact fees for the district that they're being held in um i'm just hoping that you know <laughs> i could get some food vendors might be able to have some local sponsors, you know, within the district that might want to participate so, um, to make it a little bit bigger than what it what it is. So, food vendors is part of our um, request with the permit for your event. So, yes, food vendors will be on site during that on, on that day. Okay, I think if I don't if I'm not mistaken, it was only two food vendors that were allowed per the permit that we are doing for our for our district concerts. That's correct. So there could be an opportunity to get more. We're open to the conversation. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Overstreet. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, anytime I had a standalone satellite jazz festival in the district, I've had food trucks and, and vendors and things of that nature through permitting. Yeah. Yes, and there are some that may be a community organization you like that you want to engage in to be present on site to engage with your constituents on that day as well. So that's also... Um, permitted. Um, any other questions? So I, here is my concern, and I expressed this last year, and um, you know I, I, I would echo this to um, Miss Love if she were here. I, I agree. I think this is a very important and, and marquee event for the city to do, and I'm in no ways suggesting. And plus, it's in District Six, so I'm in no way um, even hinting or suggesting that we shouldn't do this. Where I get concerned is that such a marquee event that's done successfully in other cities as well, 
I feel like should be self-sustaining. And I don't know exactly um, why we have not been able to reach that point. And it feels like we're actually moving in the dire other direction where the city is, from its general fine, continuing to um, actually um, contribute and support the event a little bit more. And that's also why I'm a little nervous about having it included in a, a budget line item. By having it separate, actually, I think, pushes everyone in the same direction of trying to make it as self-sustaining as possible versus this notion of, oh, I'll always be able to dip into the general fund to, to operate it. Um, the other piece, though, is, is that, you know, I don't know if what the model that other cities and other similar festivals have done in terms of would it make sense for us to spin this off and let a separate or adjacent or related nonprofit run this. I know there is a nonprofit associated with, uh, as far as the fundraising arm and managing arm, but, um, you know, a half a million dollars, in my opinion, actually, no, if you took aggregate a um, million dollars to be able to do this annually since we've been doing it so long, that has the reputation and the attendance and the appeal that it does, um, the fact that it's, you know, where it's located, should lend itself to being on that in that direction versus the other direction that we're heading. So one major difference in our festival um, and other festivals that you reference is that it is free for admission. A lot of the festivals, their revenue, the majority of their revenue is for admission to those festivals. Sure. And I, I again, I, I appreciate that. And it is a music festival, but you know, we've, the, our city's also been able to produce not the city itself, but we've been able to produce other free events. Um, if you think back to Screen on the Green at Piedmont Park, it was a series of events that was free. Now, it was underwritten heavily, but that's, I feel like, the model we should be following here, is that we should have enough community, philanthropic, even artistic community support that would converge on this um, if we sort of, you know, if, if I don't, again, if we, I think we needed a, a different strategy on this. We agree with that. We're working with the um, partnership director in, in looking at our ask and how it compares to the overall ask that the city of Atlanta makes to um, the corporate community and the foundation community for support of all of the city of Atlanta assets. Yeah, um, and I, I also, you know, I understand the challenge of that. We are, the, the administration's also going out and asking for support for all the other initiatives as well. Um, but all that said, um, I don't know, I, I, I just don't, maybe because I'm not privy to all the conversations, I just don't feel like there is a, a real articulated strategy in terms of, of um, moving that. And it's every year we're coming back asking the general fund to, to help um, support this. We, we share your sentiment. We want the festival, festival to be self-sustaining as well. But those we do have those those challenges and we're open to different funding models and looking at different models to assist in that effort all right uh, i'm going to hand it over to councilmember shook and then i'll, I'll come back I, i'm going to vote for this um but it, kind of along the same lines as i share the chair's sort of general strategic thinking here because like him i've I, I, i'm from around here and it is kind of this, I'm sure you guys don't like to go through this annual ad hoc that is very true. exercise, and I know that. But, you know, we have an entertainment industry that's the envy of the country. Specifically, we have a recording and music industry that's a locally a multi-billion dollar cash cow. What's the, what prevents you from going to them? And why wouldn't they want to be much, much bigger, more prominent partners. Nothing's preventing us. Our, we, we are extending our reach to that, that arena and we're um, in terms of our fundraising efforts. And so you're right, we will reach, include those organizations and entities. It's part of our, in our fundraising efforts. But why is it apparently so difficult to get there from here? I mean, I mean, a couple of these labels can overturn a couple sofa cushions and, and come up with a lot of money. That's true. We we're exploring that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and again, another model that someone just um, sent to me is, I mean, 
maybe we need to just engage a producer to do it, a turnkey producer, and that you know we're paying a fee for, but then let that expertise um, reside where it should um, in terms of, of production. I mean, it's a big lift, I know that. Um, and y'all are a small but mighty team. Turnkey so. production also is a um, increase in production expenses. Yeah, I, there yeah. We, yeah. fair enough. Um, all right, with that, I, I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve and its first one's going to be on substitute because this this uh, the motion is going to be different for the rest of these. But um, all right, Chair one, I'm yes. sorry, we um, have received a, an amendment from the Department of Finance to the caption. Okay. Um, the new caption um, proposes authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the fiscal year 2023 20, general fund budget and trust fund budget by transferring. In an amount not to exceed five hundred thousand dollars and zero cents from the general fund non departmental to be used to fund the Atlanta Jazz Festival. All right, so it's basically just form. It's form versus content. Um, all right. Um, second. This, uh, I'll make the motion to amend. Uh, seconded by Shook. Let's go ahead and open that vote, please. Vote is open. Six J zero nays. The um, paper is the substitute is amended. I'll now make a motion to approve on substitute as amended, seconded by. Um, actually, we was call your overstreet originally. Let's let's go ahead and open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Six J zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved on substitute as amended. All right, so let's go ahead and, and take the other agreements. Well, first of all, let's take the ones we need to file. So that's 23-R3154, it's item number 22. This is with Premier Events. And then also number 28, 23-R3162. Uh, this is the one with Phoenix Concessions. I believe we're filing these because the underlying contracts have expired, is that correct? So we can't use these forms to, to do it. All right, I'll make the motion to Second. file those, seconded by Bakhtiari. Uh, let's open that vote on those two items, please. The vote is open. Vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. The motion carries. Those two items are filed. All right, and then I'll take the other resolutions, uh, item 20, 3152 with uh, Force Day Services, 3153 with um, Atlanta Productions doing business as music matters. Item 23, which is 3155 with Witten Management. Uh, item 24, which is 3156 with uh, DNB Rentals. Item 27, which is 3161 with uh, Atlanta Productions doing business as music matters again. Item 29, which is 3163 with uh, Sunbelt Rentals. All right, so I'll make a motion to approve those items as is. Is there a second? From Collier Overstreet, let's open the vote on those items, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. Those, that motion carries that those items are approved. And I believe the last one will be item number 14, which is 23-01089. Uh, um, and this is essentially the authorization to enter into agreements with the performers um, as well as the potential ticketed events. All right, I'll make a motion to approve that one. Is there a second? Seconded by Collier Overstreet. Let's open the vote on those, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Six J zero nays. The motion carries. That item is approved. All right, I understand Ms. Bakhtiari has a time constraint and has two papers we need to go ahead and pull up. If you will hold up, well, let's take care of those and then I'll pull you back up for the last thank one. Thank you for your support, Dr. Jazz Fest, and we thank you for your feedback and your recommendations. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Bakhtiari, which ones are they? Uh, Ms. Kimson Wright, would you? Oh, 25. Direct us to the ones. Yeah, 25 and 26. Okay. All right, so item number 25 is 23-R3158, a resolution by Councilmember Liliana Bakhtiari denouncing the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran for its continued violence against the Iranian people, denouncing any and all entities which have not taken action against or continue to support this oppressive regime, and calling for the instatement of a democratically elected government for the Iranian people and for other purposes. Ms. Bakhtiari. Uh, thank you. First, thank you to my colleagues for making the time. Um, for allowing me to go ahead. Uh, this is a resolution uh, essentially continuing to denounce what is happening in Iran. There's 
organizations here that people are funding that are connected to this regime, please, I, I push for you to actually ask Iranian people rather than just blindly giving money to organizations that were created in this country to support dictatorships. Um, so I have constituents in my, in my uh, district that are affected by this. My family is affected by this. So I just wanted to speak to that to draw more attention, and I move to approve. All right, there's a motion from Ms. Bakhtiari. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Shook. Let's open the vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Six days, zero nays. The motion carries that item is approved. All right, 23-R3160, resolution by council members Bakhtiari, Winston, Faroki, Amos, Dozier, Juan, Hillis, Boone, Collier, Overstreet, Lewis, and Westmoreland, requesting that the City of Atlanta define Benefit Pension Plan Investment Board, the Investment Board, divest city employee pension funds from the private prison from private prisons by 2030 and requesting that no further investments be made into such companies starting in FY 2024 and for other purposes. Ms. Bakhtiari. First, I want to um, thank Finance for all the help with this paper. Uh, essentially, this is to move away from work from the to get the city to move away from working with any agency that still enlists prison labor to make its products prison labor is legal slavery it is completely it is it is morally horrendous it is wrong it's not something our system should be doing um and so i am committed to making every step to get us away from that in every way possible given that we know that certain minorities are more profiled often than others um due to racist ideology so this is an attempt to get us away from that and continue living the promise of being a civil rights city and a human rights city so i um i move to approve seconded by hills any comments or questions let's call your overstreet i think we need to at least be clear that and state that we don't have any we don't yeah. do that so we, we um had our pension um advisors look into our current allocation. We don't have any direct exposure to any um, um, any companies that are directly related in prison labor. We do have some indirect exposure that is very, very minimal. We will continue to work with those specific funds to find comparable funds that um, that lessen that exposure. So uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's already um, something that we have kind of been aligning towards, but this makes it clear that this is the direction the city will go Forward. Yes, so to make the statement that we will not be doing this again, or we, the minimal changes, but we don't, but we will not, we are committed to never doing this in the future. All right, other questions or comments? Seeing none, let's go ahead and open the vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays, the motion carries, that item is approved. So, Mr. Prothero, if I can have you come back up, let's pick up that last one um, so that we can send you on your way. And um, this is item 23-R3214. And colleagues, there is a substitute for this one that uh, cleans up the account number, so I'll make a motion to bring that substitute forward. Seconded by Hillis. Uh, let's open that vote, please, to bring forward the substitute. Vote is open. Vote is closed. The substitute is before you. All right, uh, Ms. Prother, if you'll tell us what this paper does, um, and we'll go from there. Yeah, so this paper um, grants the civil entity to support our nonprofit arts and culture sector um, in a program called, for, through a program called Municipal Support for the Arts. And so arts organizations submit a grant application to apply for these funds. And they either request support for general operating support or project support. All right. Uh, questions for um, the department, the administration on this? Yes, Councilmember Bakhtiari. So, a uh, quick question. Uh, obviously, always want to see investments in our arts. And for those who don't know, for every dollar we invest in the arts, we get at least a four dollar return. So that's extraordinary. Um, just very quickly, would like to know how we determine who is eligible for this so there is a specific uh well the eligibility requirements is that the organization must be headquartered in the city limits of atlanta and their programs that they present must take place in the city limits of atlanta they must be a 501c3 organization headquartered in, in, and incorporated in the state of georgia okay and is there anything that we well let me say this i would love to be a resource to assist other individuals in my district and around the area my partner is a professional dancer 
uh, and I mean for Glow ATL, a nonprofit. So if there, or used to be, if there's anything I can do to be a resource for this, to help artists who obviously do not make a lot of money and most are barely making, scraping by in our city, if there's anything I can do to make this more accessible to more individuals, please consider me a resource. Will do, thank you so much. In terms of the implementation of this program, does this paper essentially give you all the authority to do the selection and awards without coming back and report uh, to council of that, who the awardees are? Yes, that's correct. Is that how we've done it in the past? Yes. Okay. All right. Um. We're happy to share with you, the council, the um, grantees that are within your council districts. We'd be happy to provide that information. Yeah, I, would, I think that would be good um, just for us to know, considering the dollar amount. Um, and I think it you know, would make for a, a nice... Well announcement in terms of the you know, our investment in support of the arts community here in Atlanta. All right, is there a, a motion? I'll make a motion to approve on substitute, seconded by Shook. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is closed. This item is favorable and substitute. Six days, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is is approved. On Thank you for your support. All right, so let's go back. I believe we ended originally on item number twelve, which was the jazz festival, and that's what kind of waterfalled all that other. So I think we're on number thirteen. So twenty-three dash o ten eighty-eight. This is an ordinance by Council Member Marcy Collier Overstreet amending 22 01635 adopted by the Atlanta City Council on August 15, 2022, and approved by the Mayor on August 23, 2022, which established the Mayor's Office of International and Immigrant Affairs for the purpose of correcting accounting and personnel information in Section 6. And for other purposes, we have an amendment for this that adds position numbers, um, adds missing position numbers being transferred. I'll make the motion to amend, seconded by Shook. Uh, let's open the vote to amend, please. Vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is amended. Uh, Mr. Pace. Good afternoon again, Mr. Chair. Uh, Theo Pace, Office of the Mayor. Uh, this legislation cleans up a paper adopted last August by the City Council that merged the Office of Immigrant Affairs with International Affairs. It includes the uh, needed position codes to allow the Department of Finance and human uh, resources to basically move those uh, positions from immigrant affairs to the appropriate department orgs in the Office of International Affairs. All right, there's a motion from Shook to approve as amended. I'll second that. just want to confirm that the, uh, there is no money, additional funding that is required or is affected correct. by this. All right, any other questions? All right, there's a motion uh, that's been moved and properly seconded. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved as amended. All right. Uh, that next, next takes us to items uh, 15. And without objection, colleagues, I'm going to take 15 and 17 together as they are related. 23 01090, ordinance by Council Member Andrea L. Boone, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the uh, city's chart of accounts by creating a new special revenue fund for recording American Rescue Plan relief funds. Received from the federal government, um, H.R. 1319, 117th Congress, 2021 to 22, to rescue the economy. All ARPA budgets, posted revenue, and posted expenses for fiscal year 23 shall be moved from Fund 2508 into this newly created Fund 2509 and for other purposes. And then 23 01092, ordinance by Council Member Alex Wan, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the city's chart of accounts. For the purpose of renaming the Special Revenue Fund 2508 that was established for the CARES Act funding allocated to the City of Atlanta for the purpose of, purpose of recording coronavirus relief funds received from the United States Department of Treasury from CARES Act 2020 to COVID-19 response grants and for other purposes. I, I had Mr. Delorza speaking, but obviously that's not you. So please come and tell us about these two uh, 
introduce yourself and tell us about these two papers. Yes, sir. good afternoon, Chairman Wan and members of the Finance Committee. Chuku from Naya Johnson, controller for the City of Atlanta. So the first ordinance, 230 is for us to create a new fund for the APA grant, and this is for us to implement the recommendations by Malden and Jenkins during the FY22 audit. Any and questions? In, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, sir, sorry. So we're hoping to create the new fund number as 2509. And what we'll do also is move the FY23 budget that is currently sitting in fund 2508 for HAPA to the new fund, as well as all of the posted revenue and expenses since July 1st for FY23. And going forward, use that fund for HAPA. Any questions from Ms. Johnson? Motion from Shook to approve on both items, Second. seconded by Overstreet. Let's open the vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. Item, uh, both items are approved. Okay. That actually takes us now down to item number 30, which is 23 R 3162. There is a substitute for this. I'll read in the caption and make the motion to bring it forward. It's a resolution by Councilmember Alex Wan, a substitute by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to refund customers for overpayments to water and sewer accounts in an amount of $42,038.73. All funds to be charged to and paid from fund department organization and account numbers listed and for other purposes. Uh, motion to bring it forward. Seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. The vote is closed. The substitute is before you. All right. Any discussion or questions on this? I'll make the motion to approve on substitute. Seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved on substitute. Item number 31. 23-R3167, uh, and there, I guess we can do it. Um, actually, uh, I'll read in the, the caption. A resolution by Councilmember Mary Norwood authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $50,000.00 to Chastain Horse Park Limited, a Georgia nonprofit corporation, to support its mission of empowering riders of all abilities through life-changing relationship with relationships with horses, authorizing the chief financial officer to charge to and pay the donation authorized hereby from the account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. There's an amendment to change the reference of donation to transfer throughout the document. I'll make the motion to amend. Second. Seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Uh, the motion carries the amended papers before us. And colleagues, this is uh, actually the first of the transfers from the discretionary um, vertical fund. So uh, I think the administration is now ready. If there are others that you're contemplating, um, this would be the kind of proper form to follow going forward. Is there any discussion on this particular paper? All right, seeing none, I'll make a motion to approve on, uh, as amended, seconded by Shook. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The amended paper is approved. All right, 23-R3168. Resolution by Council Members Bond, Winston, Amos, Hillis, Boone, uh, Collier Overstreet, and Lewis and Westmoreland requesting the mayor of the city of Atlanta or his designee to identify funds in the amount of $5,000.00 to support the Black Music and Entertainment Walk of Fame development and for other purposes. Um, questions or comments on this one? Mr. Shook. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering why this isn't a carry forward paper. That's what it looks like to me. That's what it should be. I'll just say it. I would, Instead of a general fund ask. I would say that's that would be my position as well. I wouldn't be supportive of this in its current form. I just, you know, given the dollar amount, it doesn't make sense to do this because it ultimately precipitate could precipitate a number of small donations like this. Um, motion hold. All right. There's a motion from Collier Overstreet to hold, seconded by Hillis. There's no further discussion. Let's open the vote on the motion to hold. Vote is open.
The vote is closed. Aye, yeah, zero, nays. The motion carries. This paper will be held. Um, Okay, item number 33 is 23-R3200, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee to correct resolution number 22-R4256, adopted by the Atlanta City Council on September 19, 2022, and approved per City Charter Section 2-403 on September 28, 2022, by deleting the incorrect funding source and replacing it with the correct funding source, all work to be charged to and paid from accounts listed and for other purposes. Commissioner Santiel. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Remy Santil, Commissioner of Department of Enterprise Asset Management. This legislation is, is as stated and is simply just moving the funds. Any questions or comments? Approved. Motion from Shook to approve. Is there a second? Second it from Collier Overstreet. Let's open the vote, please. Vote is open. Will everyone please vote? Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries that the item is approved. 23-R3201, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute an agreement for contract number listed, citywide pest control services with Orkin, Inc. on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management, the Atlanta Fire and Rescue Department, the Department of Aviation, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Parks and Recreation, and the Department of Watershed Management for a term of three years with two one-year renewal options in an amount not to exceed $291,289.00 annually. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization account number listed herein and for other purposes. Motion from Shook to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Hillis. I do have a question for, for you on this one. So I, I'm, I, I'm glad to see the number of departments on this. I'm surprised that the dollar amount is where it's at, um, and I'm just hoping that we're not going to see a series of amendments later over the course of the year, next year, and through the renewal options where this jumps and keeps jumping. Well, so was there an effort to consolidate use and need before? Yes, but uh, also that would depend on frequency and the increase of rodents. So if we have any in instances of bugs or rodents that increases a frequency would increase which would mean a cost would increase so right now we are at a sustainable frequency but that doesn't mean that it, does, it, will, it will not change and then is this dollar uh, first year dollar amount at least in line with what these collective aggregated departments expended at least in the previous right it's consistent yes and actually some actually increased some of the frequencies okay. as well and we got a good pretty good rate as well on this particular I, I don't know if the chief procurement officer did you want to make add a comment to this while you're here uh, Jadeep Majumda, Chief Procurement Officer, City of Atlanta. We are actually looking at the scope of work, and perhaps this could be an opportunity for us to consolidate everything and then go out again with a bid so that we can capture the entire scope rather than piecemealing and adding it. Yeah, I would just encourage us to do that on the front end versus the back end because right. it just, um, yeah, anyway. All right, thank you. There's a motion and a second um, to approve. Let's go ahead and open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The item is approved. 23-R3202, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute amendment number four, the sole source agreement number listed, IBM Maximo Asset Management Annual Software Subscription and Support Services with International Business Machines Corporation to add additional funding in an amount not to exceed $140,168.00 on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management. Um, and for other purposes. Uh, Commissioner. Yes, uh, so again, Remy Santo, Commissioner of DEEM. Uh, this, the purpose of legislation is to allow a an, an, an module extension to our Maximo program that will allow our uh, real estate team to upload real property into the system and give us comprehensive view of our assets across the enterprise and allow the team to automate the entire lease, lease management process and manage contracts for critical leases uh, to indicate so we can get notifications on lease dates, rental payments, and such. Questions for the commissioner? Motion from Shook to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open the vote, please. Vote is open. 
Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved. All right, next item is 23-R, 3203, uh, resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute an agreement for uh, RFP number listed, design build for 40,000 square foot warehouse with 930 Marietta Land LLC for the design build of a 40,000 square foot warehouse space on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management for a term of two years with one one-year renewal option in an amount not to exceed $3,600,000 in zero cents. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed herein and for other purposes. Colleagues, first action we need to do is to amend to attach the IPRO uh, report. I'll make that motion to amend. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The paper is amended. All right, Commissioner, if you'll tell us about this. This paper uh, is actually being held um, and a substitute under the advisement of law for further research. Okay, so I'll move to hold this as amended, seconded by Winston. Uh, let's open that vote, please. Thanks. All right, thanks. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This paper will be held. Next item, 23-R, 3204. Um, there is a substitute, but the caption is, is the same. It's a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to exercise the first renewal option for a cooperative purchasing agreement number listed, citywide integrated security and video surveillance services with Covergent Technologies, LLC, contract number listed, GC and E Systems Group Inc. contract number listed, and Net Planner Systems Inc. contract number listed, effective April 21st, 2023 through April 20, 2024, expressly contingent upon the State of Georgia's renewal of the underlying State of Georgia's contracts number listed for each of the contractors on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management, Atlanta Department of Transportation, Atlanta Police Department, Atlanta Fire and Rescue Department, Municipal Court of Atlanta, Department of Parks and Recreation. Department of Public Works, Department of City Planning, and the Department of Watershed Management in an amount not to exceed $9,151,490.51. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and accounts number listed herein and for other purposes. I'll make a motion to bring forward the substitute which corrects the funding stream for APD and reduces the amount, um, adds additional CARES account, adds corrections as a user, and then add some missing verbiage. The, so the dollar amount actually is increasing on, uh, by $500,000, it looks like. So I'll make, it actually is increasing the dollar amount. All right, so it's been moved by Shook. I'll second the motion to bring forward the substitute. Let's go ahead and open that vote, please. The vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries this item. Uh, Substitute is before us. Commissioner. Yes, so this renewal will allow departments to order additional CCC, CCTV uh, equipment as needed. CCTV equipment is needed for a strategic locations within the departments, uh, which will help prevent vandalism, break-ins, and other serious crimes uh, that we're trying to survey uh, throughout the city. Hey, the caption says subject to the renewal by the state of Georgia. Is it is that happening before April 21st? I've never seen that before. Yeah, I know this is a co-op with the state of Georgia. That particular aspect of it, I'm not truly aware of. Maybe not. I mean, I don't have a problem with that. It's just kind of odd to see that. But all right, is there a, uh, any other questions or comments? Motion from Shook to approve on substitute. Um, I'll second that. Let's open the vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved on substitute. Uh, actually, I'm going to go back to that. So what happens if they don't renew? If with the state? Yeah. That I'm not sure. <laughs> We would have to put it back out, put it back off a bit for ourselves. Look, look for what they do, um, see if the, go ahead, and uh, you want to address that? Now, those are the challenge, uh, Jadeep Majumdar, uh, Chief Procurement Officer, 
um, those are the challenges we have with co-op. We have to understand what the co-op has or is there, and we have to take proactive steps. So from our end, we have started planning that if it doesn't get renewed, then what is the plan of action? And that is part of a 90-day plan going forward. Um, uh, for law, I mean, I don't know why I'm, I'm zeroing on this much. So, so let's say they renew two of the three. Can this legislation still move forward and we negotiate a contract with two, the two that do get renewed and then the third drops off and then they have to come forward with a new one, a substitute for that third contractor? Is that how that would work? Um, good afternoon, Amber A. Robinson, City of Atlanta, Department of Law. I do apologize. Could you please begin the question again and restate it? Yeah, Thank so you. The caption says this is contingent on the state of Georgia who are co-op doing the co-op purchasing agreement with. They renew their contracts with all three. So I'm looking at the downside. What happens if they don't renew all of them? Can this paper still carry, move forward with the two that they do and then drop the third one that doesn't get renewed and then uh, procurement and deem comes back with a separate paper? Or do we have to, does this bomb the whole, if one gets rejected, all three get rejected? Um, if you might, if I could have about five minutes sure. to review That's, the full paper critical. other than the caption, I can provide that answer. Yeah, it's not, it's not critical, but look, we'll just keep moving forward. But yeah, it was more curiosity than anything else. It's, it's actually the underlying contract, the anchor underlying oh, contract. So, it is the whole, the so it's the anchor, if the anchor goes away, all the oh, others wow. could be in jeopardy. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you for that clarification then. All right, and I'll we're... defer to legal uh, law department well, to answer that question in its I, entirety. Again, I'm still I'm going to answer the question, but I have been informed by our team that the state has informed the city that it will be moving forward okay. with with um, the contract. Oh, so. Okay. so that's a non-issue. Okay, thank you. All right, 32, uh, item number 38, 23-R3205, and we do have a substitute for this that corrects the task order number and corrects the contract of verbiage. So I'm going to read in that uh, caption. So it's a substitute resolution by finance executive committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to issue task order number uh, listed for job order contracting consulting services with the Gordian Group Inc. Construction Management Services for Fire Station 22 Construction on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management in an amount not to exceed $423,652.79. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund, department, organization, and account numbers listed herein. And for other purposes, I'll move to bring the substitute forward. Can I get a second from Shook? Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The substitute is before us. All right. Uh, next. Oh, uh, wait, Commissioner, sorry, tell us about this paper. So this legislation is just to authorize the construction management services for the construction for uh, Fire Station 22. Any questions? I'll make a motion to approve on substitute, seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays, the motion carries. Item is approved on substitute 23-R3206, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to issue task order number three for contract number listed, B, citywide architectural planning, design, engineering, and construction phase services with the uh, Fitzgerald Collaborative Group, LLC, for design services of Fire Station 26 on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management in an amount not to exceed $643,111.00. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from accounts listed and for other purposes. Commissioner. Okay, uh, this legislation is as stated. This is just for our design services for Fire Station 26. Any questions or comments? Motion from Shook to approve. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. That item is approved. Next item, 23-R3207, uh, there is a substitute for this that does not change the caption, but it's a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the temporary re-engagement of City of Atlanta retiree John Lavelle as a real estate consultant for the Department of Enterprise Asset Management and to authorize the mayor or his designee to execute a professional services agreement retroactively effective January 1, 2023 for a period not to exceed 520 days in an amount not to exceed $50,000.00, 
pursuant to section 3-505A of the Charter of the City of Atlanta and for other purposes, I'll make a motion to bring forward the substitute, uh, which adds language to reference previous legislation that authorized original agreement. I'll second that motion by Shook. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. <laughs> Vote is closed. The substitute is before you. Mr. Robinson, did you need to speak to this? No, I, I did not need to speak to this paper. Um, I did have the answer to the question about um, item number 37. If for whatever reason the state were to decide to not go forward with all of the contracts, the contract that the state did not go forward with, we would not be able to move forward with renewal, but the others could move Very forward. Good. Thank you for researching that. All right, the, regarding this paper, um, Commissioner, did you have any comments on this? No, just right. simply to re-engage uh, right. Mr. Uh, is there a, did I, we have a motion? Motion from Shook to approve on substitute, seconded by Overstreet. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries that item is approved on substitute. All right, 23-R3208, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute a special procurement agreement number listed, recyclables processing services with Pratt Recycling, Inc. on behalf of the Department of Public Works, pursuant to Section 2-1191.1 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances, for a term of three years with two one-year renewal options to be exercised at the sole discretion of the city in an amount not to exceed $1,500,000.00. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund, department, organization, and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. No. Administration asks us to hold this, so right. that's uh, the motion to hold, seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Shook wants to override the administration. <laughs> Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item will be held. Item number 42, 23-R3209, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to issue task order number one for RFP number listed, citywide architectural planning, design, engineering, and construction phase services, group at large, uh, RFP number listed with Dream ATL Joint Venture Team for post-closure and landfill maintenance of city-owned landfills on behalf of the Department of Public Works in an amount not to exceed one million. $700,000.00 with all contracted work to be charged to and paid from fund, department, organization, and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Hey, Ms. Greenlee, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Kanika Greenlee, Department of Public Works. The purpose of this legislation is um, to request a task order number one for the annual contract, a &E contract with uh, Dream ATL. It's required for our landfill post-closure care. Um, it will include reporting, sampling, and landfill maintenance upkeep on behalf of the Department of Public Works, and the amount not to exceed $1.7 million. Um, as you may or may not know, the Georgia Environmental Protection Division does require that we regulate um, our city landfills um, for up to for a minimum of 30 years um, after they have closed. Um, it will also address um, some of the concerns that were in the financial audit. Um, we will include that as a part of this task order as well. Questions for Ms. Greenlee? Seeing none, I'll make a motion to approve, Second. seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The item is approved. Thank you, Ms. Greenlee. 23-R3210, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee adopting the 2024 update to the City of Atlanta five-year financial plan for years 2024 to 2028. And for other purposes, motion to hold, seconded by Shook. Uh, let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The sign is approved. Uh, it will be held. CFO Bala, we'll see this in March, right? Is that the schedule? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank yep. you. All right. 23-R3211, uh, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the municipal clerk to place a public advertisement in a newspaper of general circulation depicting the tax digest millage rate, tax levy, and other information 
required per Section 48-5-32 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated and for other purposes. Uh, I'll move, move to approve this. Um, seconded by Shook. We need any discussion on this item? Seeing none, let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote. vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries that item is approved. Taking care of 45, we're on now to 46. 23R3213, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute special procurement agreement number listed, employee scheduling services, to include maintenance and support with Informer Systems, LLC, doing business as safe cities on behalf of the police department pursuant to Section 2-1191.1 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances for a term of five years with two one-year renewal options in an amount not to exceed $108,000 and zero cents. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed herein and for other purposes. If you'll step forward and tell, introduce yourself and tell us about the paper, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Juan and Council Members. I'm Yolanda Pascal, Budget, Budget Management Chief for APD. This contract um, is to put in place a new contract for employee scheduling services for 911. It will populate the schedules by shift um, to ensure proper scheduling based on each employee's certifications. Questions? Motion from Shook to approve, seconded by Hillis. There's no further discussion. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. <coughs> vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. That item is approved. All right. That takes us now to dual referred. Um, the first item, 23-01073, did come forward from CDHS. We have a substitute for that. That's this, right, Ms. Santana? Okay. 23-01073, um, um, I'll read it in and I'll make the motion to bring forward the substitute. It's an ordinance by Council Members Matt Westmoreland and Jason Dozier as substituted by the Community Development and Human Services Committee as substituted by the Finance Executive Committee. Um, get ready, it's a long caption. Amending that certain ordinance, number 20-01779, adopted by the Atlanta City Council on January 4th, 2021, and approved by the Mayor on January 11th, 2021, the 2021 ordinance, relating to the City's Housing Opportunity Program, so as to, one, acknowledge and approve use of an alternate benchmark interest rate in establishing the interest rate applicable to the Urban Residential Finance Authority of the City of Atlanta, Georgia, or the Finance Authority, Taxable Drawdown Revenue Bond Housing Opportunity Program, Series 2020, uh, 2021, Series 2021 Drawdown Bond, currently authorizing the aggregate principal amount of not to exceed $50 million, an extension of the commitment termination date to approve an amendment to the second amended and restated intergovernmental housing cooperation agreement to reflect use, uh, reflect use of a replacement benchmark interest rate. Three, provide for the enlargement of the authorized principal amount of the Series 2021 Drawdown Bond and provide for a further extension of the commitment termination date and maximum maturity date subject to certain conditions precedent Four, authorize the mayor to acknowledge and agree to a first amendment to continuing covenant agreements in connection with the sale of the series 2021 drawdown bond reflecting the replacement benchmark rate and an extended commitment termination date and five authorize certain related actions all in connection with the housing opportunity program financed through the finance authorities issuance of the series 2021 drawdown bond and for other purposes make a motion to bring forward the substitute seconded by shook uh, let's open that vote please vote is open vote is closed the substitute is before you all right um and the substitute I understand it takes uh, the original substitute removed supplemental from the caption, but what does this substitute do? Can someone speak to this version and then uh, into the actual paper itself? Hey everyone, uh, Josh Humphreys here. Uh, I also have Doug Selby. He can talk a little bit about the changes in the substitute in a second, um, but I'll just give an overview of what this paper is looking to do before we do that. Um, so in, in, in 2021, or end of 20 and beginning of 21, City issued um, kind of a two-part uh, bond issuance. One was an initial $50 million drawdown bond, think like line of credit. You, you spend it and then you pay down on what you spend on it um, and then authorize up to $100 million of a full, 
a more traditional housing opportunity bond. Um, the first uh, $50 million had a three-year time horizon on it, and we're coming to the end of that. So the first key thing that we need to do is just extend that further. Um, and uh, the reason that we want to do that rather than issue into the $100 million is the line of credit reduces the amount of debt the city has to pay regularly, and it's only on what we've actually spent down on the housing bond. So it reduces our, our, um, you know, our carrying costs for the, for the bond. Um, so, so we're asking in the paper to extend that out through 2028. Um, and then extend it up to $75 million. So originally it was 50 and, seven, 50 and 100. We've got it validated for that. By extending the 75, we, we, it would allow us to have the flexibility of the drawdown and go up a little bit higher, but still never exceeds what was originally approved in this. Um, and then the other, well, you know, I, I guess those, those are the main things that, that this would authorize to do. I don't know, if you've got questions about what the substitute does, Doug could probably answer those. Yeah, I just want clarification on the substitute that we just pulled forward versus uh, against what CDHS did on Tuesday. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Juan and members. Um, the, the really the only change was to clarify in the text that the extended commitment date runs through March 1st, uh, 2024. And so that was added to the paper. And then there's a standard provision that authorizes um, authorized reps of the city to sign under the Georgia Electronic Signature Act. So those were the two changes. And really, the only other primary change in the, in the documents generally are to replace the uh, LIBOR rate, which is terminating as of June 30 of this year, with the SOFR rate, which is a, the interest rate that will apply to these new bonds. Any questions for the, uh, the team? Substitute. Motion from Shook to approve on substitute. Is there a second? Seconded by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. What is open? Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The uh, substitute is uh, approved. All right, item number 49, 23-01080. Ordered by Council Member Byron D. Amos to authorize the mayor or his designee to authorize the chief financial officer to execute a master lease agreement with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank N.A. for the acquisition of 100 Dodge Chargers and 100, uh, 100 Dodge Durangos with police packages for APD fleet and three Chevy Tahoes, one GMC Yukon XL with police packages for mayoral detail on behalf of the Atlanta Police Department to execute special procurement agreements blank with Aikens, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, and Hardy Family Fleet in an amount not to exceed $12,109,782.90 and for other purposes. All right, Mr. Knight. Good afternoon, Chairman Juan, members of the committee, Courtney Knight, Chief of Treasury, Debt and Investments. Uh, we're back again with another opportunity to support our public safety par partners. Uh, APD identified these vehicles for sale, the 100 Dur uh, Durangos and 100 Chargers. Um, there's, you know, significant demand across the country for vehicles like these from other police departments across the country. Uh, ADP came to us with uh, an ask to expedite financing so that we could seize those cars and convert them to police cars. So we are back again asking for approval to uh, enter into the master lease agreement that we have with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank for the uh, total sum of about $12.1 million. Uh, my apologies. I actually read the wrong caption. Um, so I was, I was looking at that blank, the uh, revised, the substitute caption actually takes that out and it's complete, but the dollar amount and the numbers are still the same. Um, questions from my colleagues, Mr. Shook? Yeah, why well, was, uh, why did this come forward without recommendation? So as Chair of Public Safety, I uh, think Ms. Robinson can elaborate. There was some contention that this needed a, um, what do we call that thing that we always want? IPRO. IPRO? Yes. And that were going back and forth through the administration whether this required one because it was exercising an already existing contract. So I think Mr. Robinson from law can fill us in. 
Well, I was, um, I do defer to the um, inspector general on whether or not an IPRO report was required here. However, that is what the, re we were informed during the public safety meeting that it was the opinion at that time of the inspector general that an IPRO report was required here and that therefore in accordance with the code and charter that um, it would be improper to, for the council to move forward with it without the uh, IPRO report. And so because this was a dual referred paper, um, it was understood that it wouldn't be a problem to move it forward to FEC where if an IPRO report were required, it could be submitted before it being, before the paper was moved to um, full council. Um, there was in fact um, some discussion with the administration um, as to whether or not an IPRO report was necessary. Um, and from a law perspective, I would simply defer to the decision that was made between OIG and the administration as to whether or not the report was necessary. I, I take it your committee had no other angst or issues. No, okay. that was just the only hold up. And since I was on FEC and we could address this here, we went ahead and forwarded it with no recommendation so we could get that answer because uh, Mr. Amon from Chief Administrative Officer of APD said this was a very uh, necessary and they really needed to move it forward. So. Here we are. I, I do see you. Good afternoon, Shannon Manigault from the Office of the Inspector General. Um, indeed, we, when we heard the caption being read during the PSLA on Monday, we sought to stop the action because based on the original caption, indeed the caption that Chair Wan just read, it included language identifying this as having been a special procurement. It uh, turns out that with the substitute, this was just a matter of financing and that it is indeed not a procurement. And so it's with that additional information that it's clear that no IPRO is required. Thank you for the clarification. Um, so it seems like we're clear to go on this one. Um, there is a motion from Shook. I believe Hillis seconded that to approve on substitute. Uh, no further discussion. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved as amended and substituted. Um, all right. I believe that's all the dual referred. Is that correct, Ms. Kempson Wright? And I believe that's all. Oh, uh, no, we have a held, one coming off of held. Item number 65, which is 23 01019. There is a substitute for this. I'll read in the caption and then make the motion and bring it forward. It's a substitute ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to deposit all outstanding and future funds received by the City of Atlanta from the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority pursuant to the Intergovernmental Agreement authorized by Resolution Number 07-R2512 in equal shares into accounts managed by the Department of City Planning and the Department of Public Works and for other purposes. Motion to bring the substitute forward, seconded by Shook. Let's open a vote to bring that forward, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. The substitute is before you. Right. Five A's, zero nays. Motion to bring it forward. It's substitute six. Go ahead. If you'll tell us what this paper does, introduce yourself and tell us what this paper does, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Wan and members of the Finance Exec Committee. Janet e. Sudafal, Deputy, Di Deputy Commissioner of the Department of City Planning. Um, this paper basically um, allows us to, it's a correction to um, the account string that um, revenues that we collect as part of a um, intergovernmental agreement with MARTA for its bus shelter advertising program. Those proceeds are split between the Department of Public Works and the Department of City Planning. And this paper is basically just changing the account that the funds that go to uh, the Department of Public Works will be uh, deposited into. All right, questions. I actually do have a question. As I'm looking at the funding accounts for where they're going, I see for the Department of Planning, City Planning, it's going to essentially a streetscape improvement and maintenance trust fund. For Public Works, however, it's going to 
looks like DPW trash tro troopers and the project is Chester Avenue. Is that limited to just that street or is it is the application of the funds that they're receiving broader or is that in, is that street in keeping with uh, what the IGA designates? Uh, I'll let Public Works answer that question. Um, good afternoon, Melissa Davis, uh, Director of uh, Finance and Accounting for the Department of Public Works. Um, the Chester Avenue is the uh, facility that houses our special operations, and that's why we use um, that particular uh, funding source. Excuse me. Great. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, any other questions on this? If there's any, um, I'll make a motion to approve on substitute, seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. Vote is closed. Five A's, zero nays. The motion carries. That item is approved on substitute. Um, I stand corrected. Thank you. We, thank you. Um, we do have a dual referred um, from public safety. It was a walk in there. I guess the chair there is a little more lax about walk ins. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> it's Elms ID number 3223 23R3224. It's a resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee. Supporting state legislation in the Georgia General Assembly that would establish a public safety stadium surcharge for events with at least 9,500 tickets available in order to provide additional revenue for local public safety department and for other purposes. This came out favorable from PSLA. With the, there's a motion from Dustin Hillis to approve, seconded vociferously by Marcy Collier Overstreet. Let's open that vote, please. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. That motion carries. Uh, that item is approved. I believe that takes care of all of our legislative items. Is that correct? All right. Um, under announcements, I just want to remind everybody we do have a work session on the 22nd. Uh, I believe it's at, not, uh, I don't know what time it's in here. Um, it's re with regard to the proposal um, to remove move the ethics office out of the inspector general um, office as well as some proposed changes by the OIG. Um, I've spoken with law. We, we're going to. Um, she she will be prepared to address um, their review of the proposals as well. Um, uh, that's all I had. Any other announcements for the good of the order? All right. Seeing none, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much for a, a long.